basketball trajectories. Uh, <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> All right. I think we've got uh, YouTube up and running now. So I think uh, maybe we'll uh, get this started. Can everybody hear me? So I make sure. All right. Let me share. Hold on, it's, uh, it's up on the wrong screen. Uh, let me just uh, fix this here because it's sharing on top of. Uh, This thing is insisting on putting my slideshow on top of my Zoom meeting. Okay, let's do this. Okay. All right, let's get this show on the road. So I want to welcome everyone to the uh, 2022 uh, Spring Demo Day. This is uh, sponsored by the American Association of Physics Teachers uh, Southeast Pennsylvania section. So we will be talking about the new uh, website and we'll be talking about the new uh, email group and that'll be coming up in just uh, a minute here. So a little bit about us uh, for those who are new. Uh, SEPS represents uh, physics teachers uh, in the high school and college level in the Philadelphia and the suburbs. So I think traditionally that means kind of the five counties uh, surrounding Philadelphia, but we do get some members from uh, New Jersey and Delaware and surrounding areas of Pennsylvania. Uh, typically we hold two meetings per year and sometimes we'll hold some uh, workshops as well. Our membership is a uh, very cheap uh, $10 a year and that is separate from the, uh, the national AAPT. Now I was uh, originally planning on saying that this would be our last virtual meeting and we'd be returning to in-person meetings in the fall. But then last night I was thinking that uh, these virtual meetings are kind of fun. So maybe we can continue them in some, uh, in some form as well. So maybe having both live meetings and uh, virtual meetings. So that'll be something for, uh, for discussion. You know, these are certainly a little bit easier to, uh, to set up, you know, not having to deal with uh, insurance and caterers and facilities and parking and all of that stuff. Uh, we can get right into the teaching. But of course, with the in-person meetings, I think, you know, the really valuable part is, you know, cornering that person at the buffet table and, hey, you, know, you were talking about this and I want to know about that and, uh, and so on. So I think we can probably uh, continue both in some form, having both in-person meetings and some virtual meetings uh, in between that. So I just wanted to introduce uh, the officers uh, for SEPs for this year. I'm Jeremy Carlo from Villanova University. So I'm the president uh, for now, I guess. <laughs> uh, my vice president is Paula Miller over at Abraham Lincoln High School. Our secretary, who usually you're uh, hearing from, is Ryan Batke, who's now at Penn. Our treasurer, uh, who just uh, recently took over, is uh, Mark Barron over at uh, Sun Valley High School. Our past president, who kind of kept us running uh, through COVID, was uh, Laura Williams. Our section rep to the national organization is Amber Stuver, also at Villanova. Our webmaster, that's not officially a board position, but it's probably just as important, is uh, Mark Scaffinus over at St. Joe's. And we have a couple of members at large, including Bob Schwartz, uh, Bill Berner, and Jay Bagley. So uh, without further ado, this is the agenda for today. So I think uh, Mark, the treasurer, will have just a very brief uh, update. Uh, then the other Mark will be telling us about the website. Uh, Ryan will tell us about the new uh, email group, and then we'll get into uh, what you're all here for, which are the demos and presentations. So uh, with that, I will uh, stop my share, and I think I'll turn it over to Mark Barron. 
Good morning, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Okay, great. Um, we have a, uh, a very inactive account. Not much has happened in the last couple of years. Um, a balance of $5,389.50. Um, we're pretty healthy as an organization. Today's workshop is a freebie. Nobody has to you know, turn your camera off or try to avoid me today. Um, hopefully, if we are back in person next time, we can uh, go back to uh, collecting dues uh, and use it for, you know, of course, uh, getting some great speakers that we've done in the past. That is the end of my report. All right. Thanks, Mark. All right. So next up, we'll have uh, Mark Scafinis uh, talking about the new website. Good morning, everyone. Um, so over the past couple of months, we've been working on the website. We've uh, moved to Wix. Uh, right now, we have a free account. And the link is in the uh, chat as it is. So right now it is fairly bare bones. Um, we have some links, some a blog which announces news. Right now I'm in the process of filling out past meetings. I am taking information from the old UPenn website, taking the pages and attempting to print them as PDFs and add them so I'm not importing individual photographs, that type of thing. Um, right now, that seems to be the best method I have for uh, archiving some of this old information. Resources still need to be fleshed out. We have some of the basic resources, AAPT Home, Compadre, some neighboring section websites, and contacts. So what I'm hoping to do today is solicit some more uh, ideas about what people in this chapter want to see from this website. So what do we think is going to be useful? We can have individual members assigned different portions of the website. So if somebody's particularly interested in sharing information for high school teachers, we can have a blog post by that member or more targeted information. So I'll be around throughout the day. Uh, my email is available. Um, I'll put it in the chat when this is done. So please let me know your feedback on this. What do you wanna see from this chapter website? Um, now understand that something a little more advanced may be something we have to talk to the treasurer about, about a paid subscription to Wix. So please let me know what you think. What are your thoughts? If you do wanna submit photographs, please uh, add who took the photograph to the bottom of it so that we know that it's actually yours. So for instance, the photograph of the moon on the front of the website, I took that photograph, I have my name at the bottom, the approximate date I took it, just to prove that it's mine. So uh, yeah, open the feedback uh, throughout the day and let me know your thoughts. All right, thanks, Mark. Hey, you've done a really great job with the website. You know, we had that old uh, UPenn website, which served us well for quite a while, but uh, yeah, it's become more and more difficult in order to update it. So. Now, this is great. This is more of an open platform that we can get in there and uh, make changes to it. And we do need to discuss who may need permissions also. So for instance, um, so for instance, does the president need access or section reps or people who are going to update information? So that's just something that we also need to think about or discuss at some point. Yeah, so this is a fairly easy thing to edit. It's like a WYSIWYG editor that you can use for it. Exactly. You, 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 put, you drag what you want where you want it, and that's pretty much it. Does anyone have any questions for Mark? Any comments? Yeah, Daniel, you have your hand up. Yeah, I, just a quick question. I just searched for it and didn't see it. I take it it's not live? It is live. Part of the issue is we need to wait for the Google crawlers to get around to it, which can take some time, apparently, if you're not a paid member. Got so it. at this point, it still hasn't shown yet. Um, still updating the web page pretty much weekly to make sure that it's not crawled past in a sense. Um, but that is one of those things for search engine optimization. Um, you get priority when you pay. I just went to the link in the um, chat and it works fine. 
A yeah, question I had is if there's a way that we can get the old pen site to link to the new one, if we can get them to put a little redirect in there. Because that way the Google link, at least for now, will get us to the right place. Yeah, Mary. that would be extremely helpful if somebody does have, still have access to the pen site or somebody who can get in there. Mary said that it was possible, but did not elaborate. Ryan, do you know anything? I don't know specifics, but that's easy to do. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, I, it's worth looking into. Um, Penn, Penn has been putting layers on their computer sites. And, you know, it used to be that we actually handled it, but then they, they kept putting in, you know, system operators that you had to talk to who then talked to somebody. And so it got pretty difficult to get to the levers. I'm not sure where they're at now. And Ryan is certainly the person to have a look. All right, thanks. Any other questions or comments? All right, and you can always give feedback uh, directly to Mark. All right, uh, about uh, Ryan, you wanna tell us about the new email group? Yeah, no problem, greetings. Um, there's not a ton to tell. It's uh, an email group. The main thing you wanna know is you have the power to now send messages to the membership. Um, so use it wisely, <laughs> but that's not to say don't, I don't want you to edit yourself. If you see a cool news item, shoot it out. Um, this is meant to, you know, facilitate a more egalitarian kind of communication in the membership, if that makes sense. Um, so you no longer have to send me a job posting and say, get this out in the next newsletter. When you see a job posting, just send it and it's done. Um, I'll put that address in the chat. I had to make the executive decision to put SEPs before AAPT. I've seen it written both ways. SEPs-AAPT at googlegroups.com. Uh, yeah, be savvy with your subject lines because that's the only way to sort and easily find things we're interested in. Um, and if you're sending weird stuff, we'll talk to you and we have the ability to ban you. <laughs> I don't see it getting to that. You do <laughs> not have the power, only officers have the power to add members or take them off. If you uh, have someone you know should be added, please let us know. And that is easily done. So now all users can log into that as well. And you can see like all of the SEPs messages in one place. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. Or do you have to have Gmail in order to do that? Well, that might be the, I don't know the answer to that, but I suspect you might need Gmail. But I should specify, not necessarily have Gmail, but have made one of your email accounts your Gmail account, if that makes sense. Like I've had Gmail accounts. I mean, I have one now at Penn and I had one at Shipley. It wasn't at gmail.com, but it <laughs> nevertheless served as a, a Google Workspace login. Yeah, yeah. So my understanding is any email address, you can yes. get stuff delivered to you and you can send to it. Yes. But if you want to have the full functionality where you can log in and sort the messages, then you have to have a Google account associated with that email. Yes, correct. And that, that may or may not be the same email that you have on file with us. True, true. I don't see why it would matter, but we'll cross that bridge and come to it. I think maybe Anne has come up against this, but I'm trying to figure that out. <clears throat> Does anyone have any questions for, uh, for Ryan? Yeah, I, I just want to say, yes, I did. Um, I did try to log in and I, um, but the Gmail did work then. Thank you. Okay, no problem. I had to go with my Gmail. So do you, did you get, I'm curious, in my experience, people have gotten the messages I've sent as tests, um, whether it's Gmail or, or whatever. So I'm just trying to confirm if things are working. I think one of the first things I'll do later today is um, I'm hearing about a Palumbo job great place used to work there um i'll 
That'll be the maiden voyage. I'll send that out today when I find the job posting on the school district website. So you got the champagne bottle. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get the link. I'll get the direct link from, from the internal person. Awesome. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, thanks. I, I wouldn't know what to do with that champagne bottle virtually, but uh, <laughs> I can just enjoy it myself. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Did anyone else have any presentations, uh, committees, officers? Did anybody want to say anything? All right, so I guess we'll move on to uh, what we're all here for, and that's uh, the demos and the presentations. I think actually, first up, we'll have uh, Ryan. Uh, he'll tell us about uh, findings from a Harvard study on active learning and intro physics. Yeah, so, thanks. Um, could you make me co-host, Jeremy, so I can do my little setup here? I think I did already. OK. Should be good to go. Uh... Let me just do a little thing before I start talking. So, yeah, I mean, this isn't a demo, obviously. Um, but I ran across this study a couple of weeks ago and I found it pretty compelling. And I thought it's completely germane to my new gig. And I thought others would be interested as well. Um, so, the study was done by um, people in the physics and engineering departments at Harvard. Um, and it was prompted by a pervasive resistance among teachers, students, and everyone else to active learning. Now, what's active learning? Broadly speaking, it's anything that pulls students out of that passive audience role, anything not lecture. If students are doing the talking and thinking, that's a marker of active learning. And you might be thinking, well, that's just teaching and learning. Um, I agree. It's when students' lists of verbs expand beyond two, listening and note-taking. It turns out that people are resistant to devoting time and energy to, to reforms towards active learning because they're not convinced that a more difficult way that can seem messy is as effective as a well-crafted, eloquently given lecture from a knowledgeable professor. The findings from this study challenge that view. <clears throat> so. I'll describe the methods of the study while half of the results are up here on this chart. Uh, their study design was two instructors teaching two topics for two consecutive meetings. So there's two groups. The, teacher, the students stick with the instructor for both topics. But one group would do active learning methods followed by passive lecture, while the other group reversed that order and did passive then active. Um, this was meant to mitigate the effect of subject matter, like maybe statics lends itself, whatever they were doing for active learning and statics would lend itself better to more learning versus their other topic, I think it's fluids. Um, they did tests of learning and surveys, different, two different things, tests of learning, different from surveys to measure this thing they're calling feeling of learning. Um, they were administered after each session. Important to the study design was that each instructor was adept at both lecture and facilitating active learning. They had experience in both and they were known as being good at both. Um, this chart that, that we're seeing is a combination of both data sets. So across each group, <clears throat> these are averaged in, uh, these results to me are unambiguous. Uh, we see tests of learning is off on the left, active, scored higher across both groups than did passive lecture listening. And then the survey results are on the right side of this dash line that separates them out. Everything is lower in the active learning. I enjoyed this lecture, not as much. I feel I learned a great deal from this lecture, not as much. The instructor was effective at teaching, not as much. So this trend continues when they taught fluids, same results, right? you are learning more, but you are reporting that you are not learning <laughs> as much. <clears throat> so what's going on here? Um, they're proposing one of these factors here that I'm interested in. Students who are unfamiliar with intense active learning in the college classroom may not appreciate that the increased cognitive struggle accompanying after learning is actually a sign that learning is effective. 
So basically, like the students' feelings about this are not reliable. They're arguing, um, and then so one of the things they talk about a lot in the study is this idea of fluency. And if something is coming across as well laid out and coherent as an argument, then that gives you the sense that you are learning more. But what this study is saying is that's deceptive. You're actually learning more when you are the one doing the figuring out how to explain things, which is not. I think a new idea to most of us, um, but I found the study pretty compelling and helpful in my arguments in favor of active learning going forward. So this study gives evidence for something I've intuitively sensed many, many times as a teacher. That is when I do what I feel is right and put students in the position of doing the cognitive work, as opposed to me showing off how smartly I can tell them science, they perceive this as me not doing my job. Many students over the years have implied that I'm not doing my job because I'm not performing for them, not doing education to them. And I think there's this really pesky idea in education that when you're learning, you're not supposed to be confused. Uh, I find that insane, actually. <laughs> um, but it's there, I think. Uh, when teachers adopt this view, it leads them to believe good teaching is a finely tuned explanation. It involves that, but that's not really where the action is. Um, I think I'm preaching in the choir here, but I share this now because maybe you need some heavier backup if you're trying to convince students or admin. Um, and that's an incidentally exactly what these authors did with subsequent students. They have implemented these findings into their instruct introduction to the course, basically using this evidence to sell active learning to students before it starts happening. And I'll conclude there. I don't know if there's time for discussion. Thanks, Ryan. That was great. Yeah. I think and I, that's certainly, uh, it's evidence for what we've kind of always known to be true, which is that active learning is more effective, but then the students go, wait, we're paying that guy to teach us. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Agree. Um, I think it's kosher for me to put the PDFs uh, in the chat. I, I have no problem doing that. Um, I think most of us have access to PNAS or whatever we want to have access to. Are the papers open access or are they? Uh... I actually think it is open access. I'll confirm that before I distribute it. Okay. Could you put the link in the chat? Oh, not the link, the reference in the chat? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So Anne has her hand up. Yeah, yeah. I, have a, I have a comment and sure. I really appreciate that presentation that really enforces. I went to a conference a few years ago. I don't have the reference for this, but um, it was on mathematics and a person did a study on word problems versus um, math, uh, just, you know, giving tests with word problems or not. And students, you know, ubiquitously say, I hate word problems almost. I mean, almost everybody says they hate word problems, but they found that students had more engagement in word problems. They spent longer time on the word problems on the online tests, and they got more answers correct, probably because they were spending more times engaged than they did with simple, you know, to solve a very short equation problems. They didn't do as well. So this reinforces the idea that there's more interaction. And I also want to note too, if you've ever seen that guy on YouTube, his name is Vera Satyam. I think his name is Derek something. He does these uh, science videos. And I guess he got a PhD in how to write, do videos. And he's a mil multimillionaire now, but <laughs> doing it. But he said that he did this PhD and he, they did studies and they found that if they said it, when he did lectures um, and very clearly explained everything, um, people would um, say what a wonderful lecture was, how clear it was, but in follow-up quizzes would get the answers wrong. They retained their previous beliefs and didn't change their ideas. So he found that if he asked questions first in the videos, he challenged people. So if you ever see Verisodium's videos on YouTube, he'll say, um, it, that, why is the sun uh, rise and set? And people will come up with silly answers, like on the street things. And But he says that that seems to kickstart people in terms of thinking. So it, there's also that element that you you could, we, we do that so many times in demos. Start out, you know, how many people think this, the, you know, the balls are going to fall at the same time or the heavier ball will fall first. So that also reaffirms that idea. 
Um, I'll have to think about how I'm going to convince people. I'm not doing, uh, I'm not lecturing uh, that they, that they engage. You know, because the kids these days are so like overwhelmed. Do you know what I mean with everything? You know, including scrolling their social media, which has become an important priority. So um, I, I appreciate any ideas on that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I would just uh, say it, it's neat to get uh, what a credible uh, objective statement of something that I think anybody who's taught for a while, you know, would knows is true, but needs support on. I mean, you know, and, and it's true almost anywhere. You can't move forward without leaving your comfort zone. And comfortable students are probably folks who aren't learning. And, uh, you know, it's, it's neat to have this kind of uh, formalized and ready to throw out to support your contentions. Yeah, I just thought it was so clear and I really like their study design. Um, they toggled on and off the active learning with each group. And it, oh, I forgot to mention they did in-depth follow-up interviews with the students um, to validate much of what they were seeing in the surveys. And, and the corollary to this is that people who get high student evaluation ratings are probably not doing a good job. Right, that's actually to me the very interesting thing coming out of this is it forces you to think more carefully about what the data in the student surveys are set are telling you yeah much to your point it can it's not that it's deceptive but it's to be taken with a big grain of salt did they do any uh, uh weight work differentiating either whether it different, whether it was uh, more or less looking like what they expected teaching to be, so the concept of like, oh, they're doing their yeah. job. I walked into the the classroom theater and I got the show I was expecting. Yeah. Versus, I was less comfortable with the activity. Um, I couldn't follow that last part, but they did it in week twelve of their intro mechanics course, so they had had eleven weeks of what was more or less. Uh, how do I say this? It was a mix of active and lecture up to that point. So what was new that week was they bifurcated the lecture and the active parts more. It was integrated up till then and then they disintegrated it for that week. Does that make sense? So uh, that one of the things I've always kind of struggled with is whether um, how much of it is we have this this concept of being a student is what you know the, the the British norm of shut up and listen. Mm -hmm. and anything else is I'm not getting what I'm paying for. Versus you know uh, ver versus I'm actually having to work for this and I don't like it. Those are very different things. And I don't know. Mm. No, that's a good point. Yeah, I just I feel like by the fact that they changed the structure and rhythm of the class in week twelve, that would definitely cause more discomfort just by changing the pattern. Right. Um, yeah. But, but Ryan, were you saying that up until that point, they had been doing sometimes active and sometimes passive? Yes. And it's just that the only change now is that you didn't have the whole class doing active yes. on, on, on the topic. So students were already accustomed to both modes. Right, right. And you know that always, every study has limits. This is one of them, but this, I, I like the design because they did it back and forth with each group, if that makes sense. And, and in every case, survey results got quote unquote better, I'm learning more, while tests of actual learning got worse in four different iterations. Is any good work anywhere being done about changing the public perception of learn of of going to a class, and I, I, re I realize the last two years of Zoom classes has probably pushed that in the other direction, where things get more luxury and everyone's on mute. But is there 
uh, is there any good work in, in changing that expectation from I'm going to go there and be a good student and listen to I'm going to go there and expect that my that I'm paying for the opportunity to be an active learner? I'm confident in saying yes, but I can't feed you a citation right now. I'll have to dig through my Zotero. <laughs> I. I, uh, I'm, I'm going to be cynical and speak as a person who hasn't been in the classroom for about three years, but I think as the number of folks taking courses to get certifications versus the number of people taking courses to get educations, um, you know, that, that's a horrendous split. And the certification folks want this clean, neat, and let me out the door with the grade I need to get reimbursed. And so I think that war may be lost. I don't know. Is there a trend in that direction? If anything, I think it's even more so towards the certification. As education gets more expensive, it's you know more and more a luxury to just go learn stuff. Who, who do you mean being certified? You mean teachers being certified? Well, at every level, you know, like most people are getting, you know, they want a diploma to get that first job. They need a master's to move up. They need, you know, in a two year school, they, you know, like all of these things, uh, not all, but most of them, you know, and, and I mean, possibly the MCAT crowd in the physics department has to perform, but they have to perform on an objective test. So they just want to know what the answers are, um, you know. So I I think that uh, um, you know it's an aspiration, but I I don't see the market demanding that it be achieved. All right, thanks. Did anyone have any other comments for uh, for Ryan's talk? This was great. We got uh, a lot of good discussion going on. So, uh, great. So let's thank uh, Ryan for his uh, presentation there. All right, so next up on our list, we have uh, Dave Goldberg uh, from Drexel. He'll be presenting with his students, uh, Maya Levitt and Jack uh, McKinney. And they'll be talking about freshman fizz and student sims. So take it away. Uh, you're muted, Dave. Okay, you know, I, I got that. Um, so I have a couple of introductory uh, slides, very brief, but most of the, uh, the meat of this presentation will be Maya and Jack. So um, I, I, thought, I thought this would be a nice opportunity uh, to sort of tell you folks, some of whom are teaching at the university level, some of you are teaching at the high school level, sort of some interesting things that, that we're doing uh, over at Drexel with regards to our freshman sequence. Um, and rather than sort of have just me tell you about it, I thought it would be a little bit more interesting to have uh, two of our, our current freshman students sort of describe their experience and give you a little bit of a, a, of a brief tutorial. Um, just to give you a sense of sort of how this fits into, uh, fits into the program, we use, uh, Chabay and Sherwood's uh, Matter and Interaction, which I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that. Uh, it was, I believe, developed at uh, UNC. Uh, it is a very different sort of textbook and we've, we've further deviated from even from them. But the idea is that Matter and Interaction sort of focuses um, a much more, well, a much more contemporary uh, version of physics in terms of including relativity from the outset, uh, our, our course and our, our sequence in, involves particle physics and things like that from, from early term. Uh, from the first term, we talk, we do elementary quantum mechanics and so on um, on the lecture side. But our recitation, we call it a recitation, but it's really, it, it's really much more of a computational lab. Um, and the idea is the majority of our students come in. Uh, and, and one of the reasons we're, we're talking about this is not to just tell you, you know, hey, what we're doing is kind of interesting. But in fact, I think a lot of this stuff would port uh, to, uh, to high school classes as well. Uh, so the implementation of a lot of the simulations they discuss in their book uh, are done on a platform called vPython, uh, which is just a, a Python library. You can download it, 
uh, relatively simply, install it relatively simply, or you can or you can do it interactively online at closecrypt.org, and I'll put a little link in in a moment in the chat, so you can click on there and do some some uh, examples of your own. You can make a very quick account uh, if you like, or you can just look at other people's codes. Uh, and then I will say, because it's free, uh, we found this to be an outstanding resource uh, during pandemic uh, as well, but upon returning, it was such a good environment, it's so useful for collaboration that we have kept it, uh, rather than having everybody install these various libraries on their own. Um, and so what you're gonna hear about from, from Maya and Jack, and I'll give you a brief tutorial, uh, as well as describing some of their own uh, first year work, is sort of how easy it is to sort of model physics problems. And so one of the reasons we talk about with, with um, developing coding from the get-go is besides it being an incredibly uh, useful skill to have in general, we point out, you know, computers are incredibly dumb. And if you can explain to a computer uh, how a physics problem works, then you must really understand it. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop sharing now. I'm going to hand it off to, to Maya and Jack, and they're going to sort of tell you about, about their experiences. Thank you, Professor. Uh, like Professor Goldberg said, my name is Jack McKinney. I am a freshman in college. Uh, I went to high school at downtown West High School, and prior to coming into Drexel, I had no prior coding experience whatsoever. Hi, I'm Maya Levitt. I'm also a freshman here, and prior to coming to Drexel, I had very little coding experience as well. So if I can just kick off this presentation by sharing my screen really quick. Uh, here we go. Can everyone see it okay? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, so there you go. We're going to be showing you how you can use GlowScript to model physical systems. We'll be showing you three of our codes and also showing you how simple it is to get started by coding something for you live. So in this first code, as you can see, if I run it, we modeled a spinning rod with a constant torque applied to it and also graphed its angle versus its angular momentum. Now, because in GlowScript, we need to add all the rules of physics ourselves, we need to decide which we want to use because coding all the laws of physics would be very time consuming and unnecessary for most programs. So first we decided which physics equations we wanted to add and also any constants we need. In this case, we're using the moment of inertia, as you can see, and also angular kinematics equations. After that, you would define any objects you want to manipulate. So in this case, you saw we wanted a spinning rod and an axle. So we used GlowScript's built-in cylinder functions to render two cylinders with the positions and sizes we want. GlowScript has many built-in shape functions we can use, including a graph, as well as different ways to graph things. So using all of this, we move into actually implementing the physics in this while loop. So because we want the rod to spin and spin faster and faster, we apply a constant torque to it here. We then use this to update the angular momentum, use the angular momentum to update the angular velocity, turn the value into a scalar, and then use that value to find the amount uh, the rod would have actually rotated if it was a physical system. As you can see here with rod.rotate, we then actually update the rod's position, and then after that, increase the angle. So every single time the while loop runs, the rod will move at a greater and greater angle, and so appear to spin faster and faster. And then below here, you can see we simply use dot plot for the graphs to simply graph the angle versus the angular momentum. And as you can see here, we now have a pretty decent model of the physical system. And what's really cool here is that in order to do this, we needed to actually implement the physics equations we learned in class, which really helped us understand them. So now we're gonna show you a slightly more complicated thing you can do with GlowScript. Specifically, we're gonna show you how you can use it to model and create fields. So we know by using the field equation for a point charge, which is, I believe, one over four pi epsilon naught q over r squared r hat, we can accurately describe the field of the point charge. So like last time, we always start by defining our constants and any objects we need. As you can see, instead of cylinders, we use a sphere object and a button object, and then the errors that will be created later on. So in order to make them 3D, and we want a 3D representation of the field, we need to create errors in all three directions, x, y, and z. And then for each direction, build up from there to get to the full field equation. So we first use this to, de to determine the position of each arrow in space. And then we use that as well as the position of our sphere to find the vector r here and then r hat. After that, 
we combine those with our charge and our constants and put it into the full field equation, as you can see here. Finally, we actually create our arrow objects with length and direction corresponding to the strength and direction of the field at the location. We would then increase theta to actually go ahead and rotate our observation positions to really create the field in a 3D all along the sphere. And then at the bottom here, you can see we have a while loop that checks if the charge is positive or negative and will flip the field and so flip the arrow's direction accordingly. And to switch the charge, you can see we have our button. We simply bound our button to a function that uh, makes the charge, takes the charge and flips the sign. And so as you can see here, we have our field that renders in. When we click the button, it's bound to the function that flips the charge. So you can see the sign flips and also the arrows flip because if the sign of the charge would flip, the direction of the field would flip. And so I know these examples seemed pretty complicated, but it's actually really simple to get started. So to show you how easy it is, Jack's gonna code a simple example for you live. So I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Mom. Uh, so in those last two examples, students would have needed to know both angular kinematics and also some electrostatics and would even need a bit of background coding to begin with. But students in reality could begin coding in even the first week, perhaps even two weeks of Physics 101. And for high school, they could even start coding within the first week or two of AP Physics 1 or just regular level Physics 1 as well. So I'm going to share my screen real quick. Go here. So all I'm going to show today is I'm going to very simply just go ahead and create a code where a ball flies through the air in projectile motion. To go ahead and start this off, all we really need to do is type in uh, ball is equal to sphere, and then add two parentheses to the end. And when this occurs and it had run this program, a sphere should appear onto the screen. Now then, to go ahead and manipulate the properties of the sphere, say the radius, all one would need to do is have been radius is equal to, say, one. For reference, GlowScript automatically sets the radius equal to one if you do not specify what the sphere's radius is. If we run this program, the sphere does not seem to change in size. If we go ahead and change the radius something, say, 10, the sphere still does not seem to grow in size at all. That is because GlowScript automatically changes the camera to make sure that it fits your screen properly. To make sure that this does not happen, all you need to type in is scene.autoscale is equal to zero. What this does is it just freezes your screen so that now if we run this program, we can very see that the ball has gone much, much bigger. Changing that radius down to a mid size of three, running the program is now shrunk. Some more fun properties that students can go ahead and code in as well is they can go ahead and change the color of the ball. Say they want uh, the ball to be red, they can type in color is equal to color.red. Going ahead and running the program, now have a red ball. They can also change textures. They can also import textures as well. So if we type in texture is equal to textures.rub, our personal favorite, go ahead and run the program. We can now see that the ball has now turned in, into a red rub. And then one of the last uh, actual properties they can go ahead and change is you can go and change the position of the ball. So if you type in pause is equal to a vector, we'll say negative 10 comma zero comma zero, and then go ahead and add a comma there and hit run with the program, the ball should now be shifted to the left. Now, to go ahead and have this ball actually fly in projectile motion, all you really need to do is essentially set up uh, the situation as if you would any normal word problem. So you go ahead and find some initial velocity, uh, make it a vector, say five comma eight comma zero, uh, define the acceleration. If the ball is in free fall, then it's very simply just zero comma negative 9.8 comma zero. Uh, set the initial time, zero. Set the time increment, a dt, and we'll have that be equal to 0 0.1. Now, to actually get the ball's position, position to update, you need to create a loop. In this case, we'll just create a very simple while loop. As long as t is less than a value of 10, the while loop will continually run and update the ball's position. So, to go ahead and update this ball's position, we can type in ball.pause, which will be its final position. It's then equal to ball.pause would be its initial position, plus velocity times a time change. To go ahead and change the ball's velocity, we do the exact same thing. Final velocity equal to initial velocity plus an acceleration times dt. Then we got to go ahead and change time as well. So time is equal to initial time plus dt. Now, to make sure that the code actually runs, we need to define a rate. 
And so now if we go ahead and run this program, what we should see is a ball flying through there to the right. Ah, did I make the same? Yes, I did. Uh, there's one example where you need to define vec. You can define it as either vec or vector. Doesn't matter which one's just shorter than the other. We go ahead and run this program now. Now it should fly to the air, over to the right, and then fall into the abyss. Now then, what's super nice about this is that all we really needed to know to go ahead and run this program was students would just need to know a very basic background of vectors. They would need to know that a change in displacement over a change in time is equal to velocity a change in velocity over a change in time is equal to into acceleration. And then they would just need to learn some very basic Python functions. What's also very nice about this is that this kind of ties into what Professor Backey was saying about active learning. I mean, how could you get more active than having to code in the uh, actual physical equations yourself? And then it's also a very, very nice tool for students to actually be able to visually see what's going on in these systems as well. Now, what I'd like to show you is this is a collaborative program between myself and two other students that we had to code in at the end of our fall quarter in Professor Goldberg's class. To give some context, uh, Professor Goldberg instead of a competition, a friendly one, between everyone in the class creating groups of three. Uh, and so we split up the work into three different sections. This is a bit of a monster of the code, by the way. It's a whole 192 lines, which is completely unnecessary. It could have been much, much shorter, but we're still decently inexperienced. So if we go ahead and run this program, what you'll see is that the camera is following, which uh, when this zoom in, zooms in, is the Earth. Those textures in camera work were done by Jolin. Uh, the actual solar system itself was done by Cora. Uh, she had even programmed that solar system before the assignment had even been given to us. And now what I had personally put it in was this last part here, an explosion. We dubbed this whole entire code Moonfall. So this was a super enjoyable time. Going in and trying to figure out how to actually go ahead and program a explosion took me multiple, multiple hours, but it was super engaging the entire time and I got to learn in deep detail how to code these physical systems. Now, of course, with anything, GlowScript v Python has its own limitations. If you go ahead and set a velocity too high, let's go over to this example over here. Set this to 500, run this program, that ball is flying off in the distance and you're never seeing it again. And there's also some systems that it can struggle to go ahead and actually run, say springs, for example, over time, it gets less and less accurate. But with all that being said, for the purposes of helping students be engaged in learning and be able to actually visually see systems, GlowScript is the perfect tool. And once again, it can be implemented in the very first couple of weeks for students. Uh, that about wraps it up. I'll pass it back to Professor Gilbert. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't I don't have that much to add, but wonderful job, guys. Um, I mean, so I guess I just want to open up to questions to to myself um, and obviously to, to to Maya and Jack. And I want to thank you guys again for just a wonderful wonderful presentation. Thanks. Yeah, this this is really great. This is cool. And I'm also feeling a little like a dinosaur because you can tell how old people are by what they learn uh, for coding. So I did all my work in C when I came through. And that was back when the OGs learned in Fortran. So <laughs> yeah, that was a spectacular demo, guys. I thought that was just really, really amazing. Um, yeah, I, I do have a question as in what fraction of your lecture time is devoted to this? Um, how does how does how do you fit this in without overburdening them with extra homework? So the way this works is most physics classes have a recitation where they can go over homework. So in so similar to that, we take a large portion of that recitation to actually work on those labs. And so the TAs will help us through anything with the code that we may not have learned yet and really help solidify the physics. So it really combines the going over the physics homework with the coding itself. And so that's a really good way we do it. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is a five credit class, just um, to put things in context. So we have made, we've made that a very conscious decision as part of our curriculum that this, that this is basically a, a, huge, a huge fraction of their, of their freshman year. So um, it, these problems are discussed and obviously related to the lecture portion, but the lecture and these recitations uh, take place in, in different rooms um, 
for example. Uh, Paula, did you have your hand up or is that an applause? Yes, I did. Uh, first of all, that was awesome. Um, and I just completed a course at uh, Temple on coding in the STEM classroom. And I've tried to implement that in my AP Physics 1. Here's my question. Prior to this, what was your, um, your experience with Python prior to coming into this course? Were you, you pretty familiar with it or was it new to you? Personally, for me, I have literally never coded a single line in my life. And then I had done basically the same thing, except about a week before I kind of did a quick crash course to kind of prepare myself, but definitely not as in depth at all as we did in the class. Thank you. That was awesome. Mark, you have your hand up. Yeah, so this is a five credit class. Is there a traditional lab portion, a lab component to this? Um, if not, would this work well for, say, comp sci majors or others who do have to take a physics course in the upper level curriculum um, as a way of making it a little more engaging to them than mass carts and string? So that's a really good question. So the first question about the lab is we we have sort of not decoupled, but it is a separate class. So we have a first term experimental physics class uh, that's taught separately, uh, but that sort of focuses on the great experiments in, in, in quantum mechanics. Um, we, so not necessarily for the CS majors, we, we've done something similar for the, uh, the non, the non-science major. So we had our non, we had our, our, our intro conceptual physics class and one that would typically have had an experimental lab. And what we developed in the last couple of years is there was actually two different labs or neither that students could, could opt into. Uh, one of which was a computational lab and one of which was an experimental lab. They were not programming as such. Uh, they typically were sort of interactive simulation environments with sort of more, more graphical type interfaces. Um, and that was simply that was simply a recognition that uh, you know, we'd, we had game design majors, but we also had other students for media art and design. And, and it seemed like a much more appropriate way to, to, to put this. We have in the past had math and computer science majors sort of opting into, the, into this sequence, but we don't, um, we, don't we teach our, our, our engineers and our, our, our chemists and our computer scientists and so on. We teach them in a, in a fairly traditional lab. Um, I, would, I would agree though. I would like to see this sort of uh, uh, computational option uh, for even traditional uh, Surway or Halliday and Resnick type courses, uh, including maybe some option like this. And, and just as a side note, I mean, that's the way that Chabay and Sherwood, I believe designed it. I've talked to Bruce a few times about this and I believe the engineers take this at, uh, I believe, I can never remember if it was NC State or UNC, but at, at, at their, their home institution. Yeah, next year I'm moving on to another small liberal arts institution uh, in Philly, and um, their CS person has already asked me about what they could do about physics. So I'd mm -hmm. love to have a conversation with you. And that, that would be great. My email, I, I put my email in the chat, I think a few times at this point, um, but, uh, but yes, by all means, just get in touch. Just send me a reminder email. We'll get that get that conversation started. Great job to all the students. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, and just to like butt in there at the end, uh, having taken a CS course and having done these recitations for 113, I can very confidently say that I think I learned more and had a much more fun time coding in 113 as opposed to having to go through all the groggy assignments of a common computer science course. So I'm very confident that if you did implement uh, some physical as aspects to like the average computer science course, it'd be a lot more fun for the students, as well as I think they would learn more. I think uh, Bill has his hand up, and then I see Doug and Donald. Um, yeah, this was wonderful. Um, um, you know, I was around the first Chabay and Sherwood book was the E&M book, and then they decided they wanted to fill the thing out with a, with a mechanics book. And it seemed to me exactly as Jack suggested, uh, I, I was never a fan of simulations. It always seemed to me that what should be done 
is not use the simulation, but have the students do the simulation. And, and you have kind of said that, you know, that's exactly correct. Um, so, you know, my, I was always really drawn to that course. The issue to me was you, it, it looked hard to insert that approach into a three credit course that I wondered, you know, how do you fit in the coding along with the content? And so maybe first I go to Dave and, you know, how critical is it that it's a five credit course? And, you know, if you want to do something like that, for instance, as Mark is implying, do you have to lobby for a bigger course in order to use this curriculum? I would, I would say you could probably, you, you could probably make a very credible course in four. I mean, nominally speaking, like when, when we're officially saying what the time allocation for the course is, we sort of talk about an hour of coding. Um, and Drexel, I think like many places sort of counts a, a lab hour at, at, at a two to one ratio. And so if we'd simply called it, if we simply called it a, uh, a lab, a computational lab, it would have been four credits. Um, so for those who are teaching at sort of the, the university level, you could do that without cutting back on the lecture. The other thing you could do is you could you could perhaps you, you could merge them depending on the size of the course, the computational and the um, and the uh, lecture type component. Um, it becomes a little bit more complicated, but remember, part of this is we're giving an assignment every single week. Um, in terms of um, in terms of these these codes, you could definitely get a lot of the benefit by having you know one every other week or something like that, and simply using using that time in class as just extra time where the students can be collaborative and also have access to the the professor and and, and any other instructors in the course. So I mean I, I think there's a, there's a lot there's a lot that can be done with that. Um, for my part, the reason we structured it this way is to sort of justify the amount of time that students, that we knew that students were going to put into it. Um, and not just these, these two, although my goodness, I see, them, I see them down in that computer lab like almost every day. Uh, but, um, but really like typical students are gonna spend a lot of that time. And so we wanted to make sure that it was sort of justified uh, from, from their end. Uh, real quick, uh, one one additional thing, uh, Jack and Maya, did did you have a conventional like high school physics course that you could compare this one to? Like, what could you comment on a comparison? Uh, yeah. So in high school, I would say all of my physics courses were pretty conventional. I mean, I took a physics one, two, I took C mechanics, I took C E and M. Uh, comparing say in physics one to what we did for physics 113. I would say that I would have much preferred our in physical labs, at least some of them, not all of them, uh, were changed with say a coding assignment instead. Because in those labs, thinking back to it now, all we really ever did was we went ahead and took a ruler, we went ahead and did some shoddy measurements. And in the end, we would come out with a lab and a lab report that had like 10%, 15% error. And it didn't really feel like we're using to physics to the best degree possible. Rather than doing that, I feel like what would have been better is replacing that in like physical lab with say a coding assignment that would instead go ahead and code some physical system where you can go ahead and use those equations, see what those equations mean in that situation. And I feel like that'd be far more beneficial. And then for me, I had actually very little physics physics class experience in high school. So having this sequence be really the first real physics sequence I took, I think it was taught nearly like perfectly with a combination of coding and the lectures. Like I learned it so well considering it was the first time. And I really think a large portion of that was just how it was taught and how coding was implemented into it. Thanks. Thanks. I think Doug had a question. Uh, just a little thing. So, uh, Jack, you mentioned that your harmonic oscillator gets less and less accurate as time goes on. Uh, that, that's the sort of thing that can lead people to go deeper into things. So the, the, the reason that happens is there's a difference uh, between 
adapting the old position in time to update and then using the old position to update the velocity and then the new velocity to update the position. And, and then you can delve into the reasons why that's true. Yes, that's true. It's a first order approximation. So you have your little discretization error. Yeah, I mean, we, so they do they do a simple Eulerian integrator in, in mm -hmm. the first term, but by the third term, they've got there's a comp there's an actual comp phys course uh, that worries about things like that, which I guess you guys are starting now. So, great, thanks, uh, Donald. Did you have a question to ask? Uh, you're muted. I'm wondering if you had to type in the code line by line, or there's modules which you could bring into the program. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, Jack, you're muted. Uh, yeah, sorry. Could you, uh, I didn't hear him fully. Could you reiterate the uh, question? Oh, uh, you're muted again. <laughs> Did you type in the program line by line or the modules that you could bring into the program? Ah. So for some assignments, we did import, uh, say, math, just to make the math more uh, simplistic. So like we can just type in math.sign or math.cosine. Uh, other than very simply uh, importing math into BPython, it was all manually line by line. We went ahead and typed everything in. Maybe uh, for our like recitation assignments, we would be given uh, some lines of code to start us off with, just like kickstart the entire process, but the rest of it would be entirely on us. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Yeah, Bill, did you have something really quick? Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe aimed at Dave, uh, based on some of the comments from Jack and Maya. Um, is there any touch on labs? I mean, like what, you know, I spent 25 years in high school and another 25 in college. And, and one of the things that struck me, and a lot of you have heard this from me before, is that in introductory physics, we reward learning science rather than doing it. And people get into grad school and discover that basically they're in a world of uncertainty, whereas in undergrad physics, they were in a world of certainty. And if, if you're doing your stuff with Python, you know, you're, you, you know, as Jack suggested, you know, you don't have 10% uncertainty, you know, everything works beautifully. And, and can we get in this course approach, uh, can we address the issues of the fact that observational physics is always an approximation? Yeah, I mean, so as I was saying, as I was saying earlier, there there is a corresponding lab course. It is not bundled under the same course number, but they take that in their first term. So it's an experiment. It's intro to experimental uh, physics, and then a lot of students. I mean, I agree that you know, in a lot of programs, students do not do basic research or, or experiments until uh, much later on. Um, and we, you know, because of Drexel's you know, co-op program, a lot of students end up getting involved in research either in co-ops or after their freshman year or in senior thesis or something like that. So pretty much everybody um, learns the lesson that that you are not necessarily going to get what you expect um, multiple times over the course of their, uh, over their education. Thanks. All right. Thanks very much. I think we should move on to the next uh, presentation. So, so Dave, uh, Maya, and Jack, thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have uh, Mark. He'll be presenting physics on a guitar. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is uh, going to be a little bit more on the experimental side, less theoretical. Jack, Maya, great job. Um, and I guess uh, uh, after two years of really a lot of uh, just craziness. I'm under the impression the entire planet needs a little bit of therapy. Uh, one of the things that has really helped me um, and could help anybody who's still struggling with any kind of um, any kind of um, mental health issues, have a creative outlet, have some kind of creative outlet. Uh, so I uh, taught myself how to play guitar. 
which was uh I'm I'm still not great, but it really enhances some uh lessons on waves on a string. Uh so we'll take it back to the the high school level, uh where we we basically know that the speed of a wave is frequency times wavelength and that the square of the speed is proportional to tension in the string. So um if uh if you'll indulge me, uh and I think I need to borrow Jack's hair for this for the for the full effect, but uh um Probably could be. Uh, I'm gonna just try to do some close up. So if you if you pin a uh, speaker on the top right of my Zoom box, it might might help. Um, so uh, when when students get, let me see if I, I have to play around with the camera angle too. Uh, so when when students see wave in a string, if they've never seen a standing wave, uh, the standing waves are really just just really nice models. For many other things, if you want to talk about speed of sound, a lot of uh, a lot of classes do uh, like a resonance tube to determine the speed of sound. But if they haven't seen the standing wave, then they're miss they're missing out. Um, and the the fact that they could relate a standing wave to, um, to down uh, down to the scale of the atom, where you have uh, De Broglie wavelengths, uh, and up to even the scale of the galaxy, where uh, the the theory I think I saw. Uh, I think it came out in like 2012, like 30,000 years after the Big Bang. Um, the dark matter caused matter to ricochet and caused standing waves uh, in the acoustics of the early universe. So something like that. And I, I, I could certainly use, a, use, use some clarification if anybody knows about that a little bit better. But, um, but for any... Um, any, any um, uh, any student who knows that the two most fundamental concepts when it comes to, wa to waves on a string, the speed of the wave always depends on the medium and the frequency of the wave always depends on the source. So if I play with, I have it in tune, but if I play with the, uh, the tuning pegs, we can um, change the tension effectively changing, effectively changing the speed. And uh, if you decrease the tension, of course, you're going to decrease the speed of the wave. But why does the pitch go down? Well, the wavelength is fixed, right? And if the speed of the wave depends on the medium, uh, then, well, the wave speed went down, so the frequency goes down. Uh, and if I increase the tension, same thing. So um, some uh, guitars, the Stratocasters in particular, have the tremolo bar. Uh, which if I get a close-up, let me get a close-up of this. Uh, the tremolo is from uh, the Roman, uh, well, basically it's the same word in Italian as, tre as trembling. Um, but if you, I'm trying to get a close-up here. This is a bad camera shot, isn't it? Um, for a... I'm not getting a good camera shot at all. Give me one sec, please. Trying to look down the edge of the guitar. That's a little better. And uh, for this particular model, the entire bridge where the wires are, uh, where the strings are connected is just floating. So if I, nope, I'm not getting a good view of this. Hold on one sec. I have to reposition this. Got it a little higher. All right, that's a little bit better. So if we get right in to the edge here on the Stratocaster, the, the bridge is floating on springs. So when I hit the bar, I am literally lowering the tension without appreciably changing the length of the string. So when you... Uh, let me go back to a front view. Um, hold on, let me stop sharing. There we go. All right, so when you get the... 
Um, when you hit the tremolo bar, of course, it's going to lower the uh, lower the frequency. And I believe this one of the first songs that had this was uh, uh, Tommy James and the Shondells. A little bit of a crimson and clover. Of course, uh, there's plenty of um, effect pedals that will do that for me. So I don't really have to hit the hit the bar as much anymore. The um, opposite of that would basically be when the uh, when the guitar player bends the string. When they bend the string, they're stretching it without appreciably changing the the length. So of course the tension will go up. And probably nobody was better than Hendrix doing that. Uh, and I'm not going to venture to say that I can play like Hendrix. Okay, so um, if anybody um, teaches in a school, there's a guitar class, there are student guitars that are uh, really, uh, you could demonstrate this to your own students without even knowing how to play because you, you're you well-versed in the theory. Um, or you could do what I did and uh, you could just, when you're, um, when you're putting in for your budget for the next year, just write down wave generator uh, and uh, a cheap uh, electric guitar is not even maybe 150 bucks. Um, the other, let's see, what else can we do? Oh, yes, okay. Um, the, so um, if, we're, if we're familiar with our standing waves and we know about harmonics and um, if I let me get a oh. everybody's still there because I lost my screen. Yep, we're here. Okay, thank oh, you. Yeah. I'm just trying to bring it a little closer so I can get a uh, a close up here. All right. If I, uh, if you examine on the fretboard, you get these double dots down here, and that's uh, one octave up, but it's also half the length of the string. So the string goes from all the way to the neck, to the double dots, and then all the way down the bridge. That's half the distance. So if I play any note, I can get the fundamental harmonic. If I press down, on the 12th fret, it's one octave up. But if I play a harmonic, I can get both at the same time. And I might have some higher harmonics in there too. Um, and there's certain spots where you can get uh, on the fretboard where you can get a third harmonic or a fifth harmonic. And that's, uh, let's see, that was, one song popularized is uh, uh, U2's Sunday, Bloody Sunday. Okay, something like that. Um, so you can hear the fundamental and a higher uh, overtone. It might be a combination of overtones as well. Um, and let me share my screen one more time. And um, I'm just gonna call this, really this is physics on guitar part one, because uh, there's a lot more we can do as far as the electromagnetic induction. And I've become very fascinated with waveforms on oscilloscope coming from various different musical instruments. So if I just have a, a just an open note with just a clean tone, then I should get a nice sine wave. Now this is set at, uh, uh, looks like five milliseconds per box. And I have to, I can't trigger with this P3 uh, oscilloscope, 
But if I, well, I have to stop talking. Okay. So there is, uh, that is, that's supposed to be a, a middle C. That's supposed to be 256 hertz. And I'm, if it's five milliseconds per division, that's, uh, oh, I wanted one millisecond. Per, okay, that's, uh, that's about 250, right? Let's do this. If I, um, hold on. Trying to get the, uh, the automated frequency, and I think I cannot while I'm on live. No. Yeah, so that's about 250 hertz, and I have the speaker off for it. So I was right around the same wavelength. Um, now, if I put on some of the uh, effects, um, some of the great guitarists um, who also had a background in engineering, so like, such as uh, John Deacon from Queen or Tom Schultz from Boston, they would talk about wave clipping. And anytime you add a little distortion or I'm going to turn this up too. Or overdrive, uh, you get your clean signal just looks like total crap because, well, that actually looks nice because it's basically just been completely uh, shaved off in, in different areas, and that's how you get your uh, your different uh, overdrive effects. So I think I'm going to stop there. And uh, a lot of this, uh, I look forward to showing uh, one, when I get better, and two, uh, when we're in person, uh, so that we can uh, have a little bit more fun. All right. Thanks so much, Mark. That was great. Does anyone have any questions for Mark? Or requests. Yeah. <laughs> the, sound of, the sound of silence. Yeah. <laughs> Barry? Freebird. Question? Uh, not again. All right. My audio live? Yeah, we can hear you. So on an acoustic guitar, it's fun to play different sounds into the hole, Mark, and yeah. find out what's the resonant frequency of the box itself. Of course, that doesn't work on electric guitar. Well, I got the acoustic on the other side of the room, but again, that uh, I'd like to save this for, uh, this will be part, part one. We'll save part two another day for another, another conference. Day I'll jam with you because I play saxophone. Okay. Who, who said that? Barry. Barry. Okay. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll get the band together. <laughs> you saying fall uh, conference will have a concert? Anybody out there play drums or bass? Heck yeah. Ken plays what? Uh, drums. Oh, and well. A lot of portable hand percussion. I do and like I where this is lot. going. I do like where this is going. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> All right. Any other questions, as, Mark? As a slight tie between two of the previous presentations, um, one of the lessons I learned when I started teaching physics with music, uh, uh, I started out introducing the oscilloscope as a tool to see the stuff mid-program and realized I was being a hypocrite. And so to go back to the active learning idea, uh, what I started doing is putting the oscilloscope on with a microphone before we would start and not tell anyone what it was. And it was fascinating because I think probably half the science that was probably done that day was probably done before we got started. Cause you'd have a group of a hundred people and gradually a leader would emerge who would say, okay, everybody shut up. I think it's sound. Let's see if it's sound. And they would like start to do their own experiments and minimize variables and so forth, which I realize is scaled more toward a younger audience, but the sort of um, my, the, the most elegant thing to me is always um, entirely self-motivated active learning. And so there are a lot of great experience of, of opportunities for that in, in what you're doing. Let them mess with it. Yeah. And the, one of the, uh, yeah, they, they do have a lot of fun with it. And of course they just want to see uh, they just want a, a free concert, some of them, but uh, um, 
so uh, going back uh, to the conceptual points, um, if the if the speed of the sound depends on the medium and the frequency depends on the source, the, the big question is what do you do when the source is the medium? Because that's basically how you get the standing wave on the string. And um, and the other question is, does this count as resonance? Because I don't have an external frequency driving, it's just my hand, which is not matching the oscillating frequency of the string. So the kids had some in-depth discussions trying to figure out, is it resonance or not? Or all standing waves resonance is even a standing wave. Um, so, uh, so a couple other uh, fun fun things to debate with uh, with students. All right, let's thank uh, Mark for his uh, presentation. Uh, there we go. <laughs> all right. I'll and, mute uh, now. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Ron Pedalty, and he'll be telling us about plane mirrors, astronomy gifts, and goofy lab objectives. Yeah, Take it first, over. first, I'd like to congratulate Bill Berner on finding a virtual background that so perfectly matches his shirt. So I, I'm, I'm pretty impressed with that. Uh, I don't know how long he had to bing or duck, duck, go to find that library picture, but I'm gonna look for one for, for my background because uh, that's pretty impressive. So um, while we were virtual, I just started sort of a running gag in my labs where I changed the purpose of the lab to something else, which I'll share with you. And now whenever we do a lab that, and, and I change the purpose to this goofy idea, I get groans and, and laughter across the classroom. So I'll share that idea with you. Just some uh, weird, uh, a weird way of, proposing a lab. And then I've got, um, when you draw a ray diagram for something simple like a plane mirror, and you show that all the rays reflecting off the mirror, it's as if to the observer and to the eye, as if all those rays are coming from a point behind the mirror, that the image actually lies behind the mirror. That's hard for the students to grasp because a lot of students think that the image is on the mirror, like looking at a a poster on the wall. So I made a little demonstration showing that the image lies behind the mirror. And then I've made uh, two or three short little GIF animations to demonstrate different ways of detecting um, exoplanets, planets orbiting stars and other star systems. Uh, those, because they're GIFs, they, they don't repeat, repeat, repeat in the video that I've made. So when when this is over, I'll just run them again so you have a chance to see them. I'll also put a link to all these files on uh, Google Drive in the chat so you can spend some more time with it. But let me just show you um, if I can share this. And hopefully the audio and stuff will come through. I'm just gonna run it for a second and you can tell me if you can hear it. I would like to mail it to Dr. Albert Einstein. So is that coming through for everybody? Yeah. Okay. In Princeton, New Jersey. Well, I'm going to have to calculate the postage. So I'll need to know how much it weighs. And here's my method for determining how much postage I'm going to need. Well, there's our data. 
Let's see if we can calculate the postage necessary to turn my moment of inertia disk to Dr. Albert Einstein. Good luck. Hi, everybody. I have this beautiful sash weight that I would love to send to Albert Einstein at his home address, 112 Mercer Street, Princeton, New Jersey, 08540. I want to send it priority second day mail, but I don't know how much postage I need to put on it. So to calculate the postage, here's what I plan to do. I've got a garage door spring suspended from the ceiling in the classroom over here. I'm going to hang my sash weight from the spring and let it come to rest. I'll put a little marker on the sash spring so that we can see where it's hanging with a uh, meter stick. I'll add a kilogram mass to it and we can see how much extra stretch the extra kilogram gives the spring. I'll take the kilogram mass off and set the sash weight oscillating with a very small amplitude oscillation on the spring. You can see that I have a stopwatch set up as well in the camera view, reading 000 right now. And uh, we can time the period of this oscillation. I'm hoping that with that much information, we'll be able to calculate how much postage is required. So let's give it a try. Well, perhaps we have enough data. Let me know what you think I should put on my sash weight package to send to Dr. Albert Einstein. I got this really swell moment of inertia demo disk. All right, so um, now in, instead of if, if I put a meter stick on a binder clip so that it teeters and the students slide a block of wood with the known mass out along the meter stick until the meter stick tips and then they calculate the mass of the meter stick. I, I don't say, let's see if we can find the mass of the meter stick using uh, the idea of torque. I say, I wanna, sh I wanna mail this meter stick to Albert Einstein, how much postage do I need? And, and they all know that it's going to be Instead of uh, saying, let's find the mass of the, oh, let's find the mass of that. I, I'm always saying, let's see if we can calculate the postage to mail this to Albert Einstein. And it just seems sort of silly. Now, everybody gets different values for the postage because 
they're using different postage calculators. And of course, they're only being graded on their ability to accurately find the mass. But it's just been sort of a funny running joke <laughs> in class. And, um, and the students seem to appreciate it. And it, it's fun for me to, to set it up that way. Um, the mirror thing is really quick and easy to set up. And I'll set up two or three of them around the room and students can come by and look at them. It's surprising how something so simple really, really amazes them. And it gives the impression, it really get, gets across the idea that the image lies behind the mirror, not on the mirror. And then I'm, I'm just gonna play these, uh, let's see if I can share this, um, just so, so you can see, at least what I want you to see is um, maybe this one. Uh, if I can get this to, oops to repeat that I can talk about it just for a minute. Okay, close that and share that. And let me see that. Okay, that's probably gonna do it. So um, the this is the earth or, or some planet orbiting a star and the center of mass of the star sun system is that green dot. And you can see that that's remaining motionless. Both objects are orbiting their mutual center of mass. When the planet moves away from the observer over here, the star is moving towards the observer and the wavelengths get shorter and I've colored them blue. When the planet moves towards the observer, the star wobbles away. The wavelengths are Doppler shifted to longer and I've made them turn reddish. But I didn't want the students to believe that when you look at the star, the star is turning red and blue and red and blue. So down here, I showed the hydrogen spectrum and just showed that really what we're observing is that the lines of the hydrogen spectrum aren't where we would expect them to be, but they're shifted to longer or shorter wavelengths. So there's just a, a quick GIF that I made um, to demonstrate using radial velocity as a way of detecting um, exoplanets. So that's it. That's what, I, that's what I have to share. Of the, the virtual labs with the oscillating sash weight and mailing the uh, moment of inertia disk, I'll, I'll put a link in the chat. And not only will you see, of course, when the students see it, it's not all sped up in the middle. That was for, you know, for our sake this morning. Um, but they can collect data from the video. And then I made a second video for each of those because this was back during the pandemic days where I collect the data and I do all the math and I make my prediction. The results on both are like within just a couple percent, the, the results are really good. So if you want to use or abuse any of those videos in any way you want, I'll put a link to where you can get the GIFs and the, and the um, animations and things. That's it. All right, thanks Ron, that was great. I do have one uh, quick uh, suggestion there. Uh, so the idea with the plane mirror using the idea of parallax to figure out where the images are located, would it be possible to do that with a half silvered mirror? That way you could look through and you could see the transmission and the reflection at the same time and then line it up so that they both move together. Yeah, and in fact, the way that we would often have done this in a classroom is to use pins where the pins up, sticks a little bit above the mirror and you look into the mirror and you look above the mirror and you mm -hmm. find the location, and probably okay. many of us done that, stuck the pin in the cardboard. So yeah, that'd be fine, but just a plain one foot by one foot mirror is pretty easy to come by. Um, but yeah, I like that idea. If, if you can find a half silver mirror where you could see both at the same time, right through the mirror, that, that would be, and it would also make it easier to set the uh, demo up as well. So that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, Bill. Um, we've, the cheap way around that, is a piece of colored plexiglass. Yes. Okay, because it we we have used, I think it's an orange piece of plexiglass at Penn that you can get a one foot piece and kind of do that same thing. And what we use is um, like a, a plastic uh, half gallon milk or a gallon milk jug and put a flashlight inside it to make it stand out a little more. And we put one in front of that plastic and one behind it, and you can move them to where they overlap. And then when you look down on top of it, your, your positions are symmetric. That's great. 
Yeah, there was something that you could buy commercially, which was just a piece of orange plexiglass. I think it was right. That mirror, a mirror. mirror. A mirror. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Sure, Pasco would get like a couple hundred bucks for that. <laughs> hey, or you Ron? make it. A <laughs> Ron, uh, yeah. can you guys hear me? Yeah, Barry. A uh, technical question, Ron. So the center of mass of the planet star system, the center of mass. I, wait, 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 wait. I know your. <laughs> I, know your I know your question. <laughs> it has a very special name. But. It has a very special name. I hope everybody here knows what that name is. And what is that, Barry? With one R, the Barry it, Center. It's the Fearman Center, isn't it's it? The Fearman Center, yeah. The Barry Center. And the funny thing was, when I, I spent two years at Swarthmore, and my master's thesis was the orbital motion of the photo center of a binary star about the Barry Center. Because I knew I had to figure out some kind of a relationship of Barry with two R's and Barry with one R for my thesis. And it was just the highlight of my intellectual career. Yeah. Good call, good call. Now, are you made up of baryons? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any other questions for Ron? All right. Next up, we have uh, Ann Tabor Morris, and she will be talking about conservation of energy, writing equations starting with zero. So take it away, Ann. There's the unmute right there, sorry. <laughs> okay, so I have a, a little slideshow. Um, uh, I did uh, something very similar here to this um, last summer at the AAPT National Virtual Conference. And I'm really interested in input because I'd like to put something together for a publication. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna run down my slides here. I don't wanna spend a lot of time dwelling on this, but um, when I went to, to put this in for a paper, um, I was looking for the right session and there's a session called Spiraling Physics, which I had never heard. Now, what I do is not the same as what these uh, people were doing with Spiraling Physics, but I invite you to look into it it's kind of the same idea. Um, so the idea is that we have these uh, laws called the conservation of energy and the conservation of mass. So um, I'm arguing the students can become more grounded in physics by the realization that there are multiple applications of this rather than just learning another equation. And some examples of conservation of uh, energy are the specific and latent heat problems. Uh, Kirchhoff's two laws of electricity, which involve voltage loops and current splitting. Uh, this is actually conservation of energy and conservation of mass. And Bernoulli's law, um, scaled per volume and con um, the continuity equation that you would use with Ber uh, Bernoulli's law, scaled per time, uh, which is fluid dynamics, um, which ended up on the line. Okay, but I'd also like to present this as not an, a primary way of showing this to the class, but as a secondary rethinking, think twice. Um, and um, I under, think it underscores the broad importance of the conservation laws and aids in student recall too. Um, okay, so there's some caveats here. Um, conservation laws such as energy or mass do not imply the laws can be scaled or multiplied by random factors. For example, I'm not proposing new laws here. Momentum is conserved, but not P times V, okay? Uh, and you'll see what I mean in a second. Um, and um, we're, this, these are scaled relations in terms of dimensional analysis and coming to realize that these equations have parallels uh, and that these equations like Bernoulli's law aren't just out of the blue, you know? So we're spiraling back to re reinforce the conservation laws. Um, so I, I, what I'm proposing here too is um, not using what we often do as uh, n equals out, but doing as, a, as an afterthought. Again, you can present it as n equals out, but as an afterthought, reordering it as zero is equal to n minus out. In other words, the universe is self-contained um, or perhaps your local experiment is self-contained and when you have something in and something out, it's going to be equal to zero, which seems pretty obvious, but wait till you see what I'm doing here. And again, this is revisiting as a second thought, not as the primary teaching mode, okay? Um, I remember 
years ago um, in the IBM buildings, they would always have this, uh, uh, they had this word think. They'd have a poster all over the buildings, think. So mine is think twice. Okay, um, here's a few, um, starting with a thermodynamic problem, um, the derivative of over time of energy is zero in a close isolated system. So um, this is the equation here for specific heat and latent heat. So an energy term would include specific heat and latent heat for say an ice cube that melts. The ice cube changes phase, that's the, the latent heat part, then the ice cube warms up to room temperature. So um, this is just standard equation here. So how would I use this? Okay, so you get students, if you're doing um, specific and latent heat, first you have to get them used to the equations, then you have to get them used to like, you know, uh, um, applying it. And then there's this transcendental moment where you realize that in the energy, in the, I'm sorry, in the universe, energy is conserved. So in energy incoming minus energy outgoing has to be equal to zero. And I, I, this is one of the things I have loved about physics in my own career is that there's these transcendental moments that you have where you realize things like that. Now, most books will present it this way for latent heat, but they put the zero at the end. So my argument here is that sometimes the students lose steam and forget what they're doing by the time they get to the end of the equation. And of course I could put zero equal to zero out here also. Um, I mean, that doesn't really, doesn't really matter. But um, the idea, if you start up front with this and then they start dealing with all the terms. So I chose a rather simple one here. This is just one latent heat and one um, uh, I'm sorry, one latent heat term and one specific heat term here for a metal cooling and water warming up. But some of these equations get pretty hairy. You have the water and you have the cup and you have the piece of metal or you have the ice. And then you, have, you end up with a lot of terms. And sometimes on tests um, uh, or in homework, students just get lost. They get all the terms down, but they forget what it's all equal to at the end. So this is the sort of thing that's already presented in books equal to zero. I'm just putting the zero out front, okay? Um, okay, here's an, a complicated one with ice melting. So you stand up all, all these terms. I'm even going to multiple lines. Um, and again, you have to set whether it's a positive or negative term for latent heat. Specific heat, you don't have to worry about. But if there's latent heat, if it's coming in, I say it's like when your friends come over, you're happy, it's positive, hi. And if your friends leave, the energy's leaving or go, and going into something else, your friends leave, bye, and this is negative. So students have to make that. The first time that we um, show conservation of energy is typically um, in the uh, roller coaster problem uh, here where an object starts out with a lot of potential energy, loses potential, gains, and I am, I have, um, and, and usually we set this up as K1 plus U1 equals K2 plus U2 equals K3 plus, U, you know, at different situations. I'm not sure if this would work as well here to introduce it. Might be a good afterthought later, but, um, you know, I'm not, that's not the place where I think it really comes into play as well. Let me show you here, um, Kirchhoff's laws. So uh, I've randomly labeled this Kirchhoff's law number one. This is uh, the, the uh, basically the conservation of mass. It's the conservation of charge over time. Um, and of course, this is a very simplistic uh, thing. You can have other things like, you know, I'm, I'm just using a simple circuit here, as you'll see in the next slide for a resistor. You know, if you have an inductor and stuff like that, it gets more complicated, but here you see, I1 is the current coming in and I2 and three are coming out. And um, I'm sorry, this should have been a plus. Um, okay, so what I did here then is to say, well, if I1 is coming in, then I2 minus I3 is going out. Okay, so it, it, like I said, this is the engagement of the students and trying to figure out, do I just put random eyes wherever or do they think about it as, current coming in and charge coming in and current going out 
and other current going out and splitting, okay? Um, so subtle, but perhaps helpful to students could be to do this. Again, as an afterthought, um, a further engagement, so to speak, you know. Um, Next slide, sorry. Okay, here's Kirchhoff's law number two. I've randomly named it number two. I don't think there is a number associated with it usually. This is a conservation of energy uh, situation. And here we have uh, the EMF is being put in. That's the electromotive force, uh, which is really a, uh, a voltage. And we have going out the, uh, the voltage drop due to the resistor. So, and of course, if you have currents that are going in opposite directions with much more complicated circuits, this is very useful. Again, putting the zero first is my point here. Say we're gonna start with zero and then have all the inputs minus all the outputs, okay? All the, all the um, and, um, and, and depending on current uh, direction also. Um, so that's, uh, that's that, I'm almost done here. Um, Bernoulli's law, and this is, looks like a very um, uh, complicated slide, but uh, scaling as a bit of a cheat. So these first things are just the terms here, where instead of uh, using work energy, I use work over volume, which is pressure. Instead of kinetic energy, I use uh, kinetic energy over volume. And instead of potential energy, I'm using potential energy over volume. Uh, and we do get then this uh, Bernoulli's law, which is this right here. And it, when it's scaled per volume, because the volume stays the same, um, it is a it is a um, energy conservation law. Bernoulli's law is an energy conservation of law. Remember, pressure, which is the first term here, is not conserved, but energy is. So a more appropriate way uh, and of course, I don't show the volume here. I could, I could have put the volume in here, but it's going to cancel. This is just per every term here. Um, sorry, question mark, <laughs> not question mark. Um, you know, so it, it's emphasizing the fact that 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 um, and and it, Bernoulli's law really is the old roller coaster law. Here we have a lot of fluid, and then it gets uh, and, and it comes down here, increases in velocity, right? And um, now Bernoulli's law is not just this another law to like remember. Oh yeah, there's something about fluid dynamics. Uh, it's just another application of Bernoulli of uh, energy conservation. Continuity equation is the conservation of mass, but now here per unit time, again starting with zero. This is the full continuity equation for fluid dynamics. Um, and I have actually, uh, 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 okay, so anyway, mass over time is being conserved, right, over the same time unit. Um, tell me if I'm missing anything here, if you would. Um, okay, and some conclusions, spiraling back to um, the laws of conservation of energy and conservation of mass, um, using zero um, uh, on one side, so that positive negative values uh, are come out and then using zero first before students forget or telling the students to do it before they forget, oh yeah, this is all gonna be equal to zero. We live in this transcendental universe where whatever goes in is equal to whatever goes out of a system, uh, an isolated system. So like I said, I don't intend this to be the primary way of teaching it, but as a way to loop around is to have students re-examine what they've been doing uh, after they've encountered these equations. Thank you. Please, any questions <laughs> or comments right. or, or suggestions? Thank you. All right. Thank you, Anne. Any uh, comments or questions? Barry, I have a comment. Yeah, go ahead, Barry. It reminds me a little bit of uh, when I'd say to a class, especially ninth graders, uh, you know, th this is half as big, but my students, many of them were thinking it's twice as small. It's two versions of looking at reality. And it's kind of interesting to see you move the equations back and forth to say either this equals this or this minus this equals zero. It's, it's a different person. 
Thank you. Yeah. I like that. Half as big, twice as small. I was I was thinking actually um, about like how we think when we talk about velocity, it's meters per second, but it's also a rate, it's a rate of change. So it's really seconds per meter too. You know, if you're going at one meter per second, you're also going in one second over one meter. So twice as slow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's the old thing, you know, the pessimist and the optimist, right? The glass is half full or half empty. So yeah, Jack, you have your hand up? Yeah, so just kind of just reinforcing the idea that like putting zero first is a really good idea. I remember back in A-Physics 2, only a couple of years ago, my teacher also put zero first uh, while doing Kirchhoff's loop rule, which really helped students reinforce the fact that this needs to be equal to zero as opposed to when in A-Physics 1, we went ahead and did the conservation of energy equations, like what, what you said with the hill, going ahead and setting the uh, first part of the equations equal to the last part of the equations. A lot of students really do forget that, like this conservation of energy is uh, there, it's all equal to zero. But like, just like with Professor Jackson saying in the chat as well, I do think Kirchhoff's loop rules and laws are a really good example as to where putting zero first is really important to reinforce those ideas. Thanks, uh, Bill. You have a um, I I I like I like the whole thing, and um, I might say you're being a little timid, um, and maybe it shouldn't be a secondary approach. I mean, along the lines of you never get a second chance to make a first impression. I like the idea of starting with zero, and maybe don't give the students a chance to think differently. Um, you know, and come in with it in the other direction because I, I think that it's a it's a strong statement of that conservation principle, to speak of it as a, a balancing situation. Um, and, and again, one of my uh, pet topics, you present a strong supporting case for. Uh, I I think that we screw up throwing Bernoulli's principle at every aerodynamics problem we have. And uh, it's the wrong way to explain why wings and baseballs change direction because they're not closed systems. And so if you present Bernoulli as an energy conservation, you know, having a baseball in the atmosphere of an entire planet is not a closed system, uh, nor is an airplane wing in the atmosphere of an entire planet. And so you wanna look to something else. And of course, it's going to be, you know, which way is the air leaving the object on and you, you fall back to conservation of momentum. Um, so I think there are many benefits in what you're talking about there. And uh, I like the presentation a lot. Yeah, nor is the flight of an airplane uh, conserving mechanical energy because the right. air doesn't get hot. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Uh, Mark, you have a question? Yeah, I have um, two comments. Um, thank, thank you, and it was very good. Uh, one, this kind of takes me back to um, when I was teaching the AP Physics B curriculum, which was pretty much a survey of all the different areas of, of physics. Uh, and and the, the rule of thumb was pretty much in your second semester, don't forget your first semester physics, because you're going to apply conservation energy and Newton's laws and all that, all the uh, stuff you learned first semester in your second semester uh, uh, topics. Um, and I haven't, I have personally have not taught those, those topics since, uh, the college board changed from B to, uh, physics one and two, and I only get to teach the one. Um, but the other comment I have is, uh, I, I, I seem to, uh, have, have this belief that the number one type of math mistake people make, whether you're taking algebra one or you're a PhD, uh, the number one type of math mistake people make is a plus minus mistake. Uh, and I, I do, uh, I, I consciously try to set up problems where we're just going to have fewer uh, plus minus issues. For example, how you set up your frame of reference in a mechanics question, let the direction of acceleration be your positive direction um, or circular motion, centripetal motion problem, let towards the center of the curvature be your, be your positive direction. Uh, but then when we talk about energy, plus minuses for uh, for vectors is basically direction, but plus minuses for energy 
or any scaler is pretty much measured as gains and losses. So I do like for like Kirchhoff's rules, do setting it equal to zero as you go around the loop. Are you gaining energy with the circuit element or are you dissipating energy? So that is a very effective way to do it. So it's a, kind of like a double-edged, uh, do you want to introduce more plus minus signs? Because you know someone's going to mess it up. But in uh, as far as uh, conceptually, it's a, with Kirchhoff's especially, it's a great way to do it. Yeah, and um, also it does work for flux, like electric field flux going into the box versus electric field going out of the box. It's a total zero then. And, um, the, and I do appreciate you make a good point about vectors being plus minus and energy being plus minus. You can't have negative energy. <laughs> you it, a total and a negative energy. So it will change in, right? You can have a, a, a loss of energy, a, a negative delta energy. Right. But you can never get z negative five kilojoules or whatever. <laughs> so that's, that's something I'd, I'd like to think about for a while. And I appreciate the other comments too. Um, now I had to do, I did have a question. Um, when you say Bernoulli is the whole and system of the entire planet, can't you say that at a certain point there's a negligible amount that it almost goes to zero that you could isolate it, say at one mile out from the object, the airplane uh, or something? Cer certainly, but um, you know, every analysis of Bernoulli though has that closed tube you know, and it's a compressible gas and, and, you know, you're really controlling that environment. And uh, when you start looking at, you know, like all of this shenanigan as to which way a curveball goes, um, based on Bernoulli, you know, the question is velocity relative to what, you know, like they, they talk about the higher speed uh, air having a lower pressure according to Bernoulli. Um, and of course that's in the closed tube, you know, but that high speed air, um, you know, why is, it, why doesn't it take care of the pressure by bringing air down from above the wing rather than bringing the wing up from below, you know, but the real question is which way does the air slough off the wing in and it comes off downward. So you've just given the air a, a downward momentum, which means the wing is gonna get an upward momentum. And, uh, you know, I think if, if you look at military planes, the, the whole Bernoulli thing falls down, you, you know, they say, well, okay, the air's going faster over the top of the wing until you hang all that ordnance under the bottom of the wing. And it doesn't matter. I mean, they put like 47 rockets and an engine under there and the plane still flies. And it's because the top of the wing is really the thing that controls what happens and there's a thing called the Coanda effect. It basically means the fluid sticks to the surface. So if the wing has that downward curve, the air comes in hor relatively horizontally and goes out downward, which now means there's a momentum change on the wing as the acting object that causes it to go up. The same thing happens with a spinning ball. Which way is it sloughing the air? Um, Howard Brody, I. I shouldn't be doing a presentation, but at Penn, we had Howard Brody who, you know, switched from particle physics to tennis. And he always analyzed what a tennis ball was doing by which way the air was leaving the ball. And that was long before anybody had good names for it. And he said, you know, just don't even talk about Bernoulli, but how is the air getting out of the way of the ball? And if the ball's spinning, you're giving the air a favored escape route and bingo, you start to put forces on the ball. Isn't there something too about like, well, there's the Reynolds number, which allows for that buffer between, you know, that, so that's like the slowing down of the air to the surface, but also, isn't there something about turbulence now they think? Well, and, is, and is absolutely. I mean, the, the Reynolds number is, a, uh, is gonna answer the question of whether you're in a turbulent or a laminar flow zone. Okay, because it's a ratio of inertial to viscous forces. And so the question is, does the stuff stick together or does the stuff go off on an inertial path? And so the air going over a wing in many ways is like a skier going over a hill. And like, is it going so fast that inertia 
takes care of it and it leaves the surface. And if it leaves the surface, you lose control and you get turbulent flow. But if it sticks with the surface, you've got laminar flow and you're controlling what's going on. Uh, depending on your fluid, that the contour that that works for, okay, changes, which is why you care about Reynolds number. Great. I like the steer. That's a great idea. <laughs> Donald, yeah. did you have a question? But, 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 on the other hand, too, you know, they can simulate these in wind tunnels. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that is a closed environment. Uh, but your point, you know, there, certainly there's a point of diminishing returns. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that you lose track of the kinetic and potential energy of the air as it's passing over a wing because it's not staying in a tube where you've got a document on it. Well, it all does work for pipes, though. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, and it's absolutely through, through correct. Pipes. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying you, you don't use it. I'm saying that you, you present it as conservation of energy, and you don't ever apply conservation of energy in an open system. You know, like your, your postulate right. there is that you have a closed system. Thank you. Donald, did you have a question? This is probably for Bill. Why do they make airplane wings with the tips up now? Um, and really, yeah, you, you, you're <laughs> just turn the hose on and wash me out of the room. Um, you want all the air going over the wing parallel to the plane's motion. And if you put those tips up on the wing, you don't let the air escape off the end of the wing in the wrong direction. And it does wonders. Uh, you can raise the lift. What they discovered on the 737 was that they could raise the lift by as much as 10% with wing dams at the corners. Um, and if you look at the wings they throw on the back of cars, if they're well done, they've got end plates on them to force that direction. If you look at Soviet fighter planes, they've been doing that for years because they put air dams in the middle of the wings. MiGs have got those, those uh, fins in, in the middle of the wings that force the airflow to remain parallel to the plane's movement and do its thing. Um, they don't let small planes follow, follow 747s into airports because the downward movement of the air off of the 747 wings is lasting. And it's such that it will slam a single engine general airplane into the runway if it comes into that air movement as it approaches the runway. And you can't see that. So you've got to let the air settle down before the, uh, the small plane comes in. Thank you. Maybe I'll, I'll be the contrarian here. Uh, so there, there is a big difference between say Kirchhoff's law because you have two very different types of currents, right? There's currents that go in, there's currents that go out. Whereas when you're doing a conservation of energy problem, you're looking at a continuous variable, which is time. You know, so you might have a multi-step process, T1, T2, T3, and saying you know, E at T1 equals E at T2 equals E at T3 is pretty straightforward. In fact, there's nothing special about T1 through T3 because time is continuous. Energy should be constant. Whereas writing it as like E at T1 minus E at T2, it's not as straightforward. You don't see that, that continuous symmetry in time. Well, these, these are at least, I mean, I, ha I haven't really explored, you know, um, time variant circuits because in a resistor, a simple resistor current circuit, um, it doesn't matter what time it is. It's because that chunk was the same as the next chunk. Well, but I meant more like for energy conservation. It, 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 or, might, it might be more, is that? As I meant more for like energy conservation or Bernoulli type problems. Like you, you don't necessarily have to select out T1 and T2. It could be continuous. Right. And writing as zero equals one minus the other makes that less obvious. Mm -hmm. The continuous symmetry in time. Right, so which we later, which we volume later over time for that. 
because the time it's not just vol over volume, it's volume over time because the time would be the same time slice. You're, you're making the point that, that in Kirchhoff, it's not so straightforward, except for very simple problems. Well, no, th then it works well, because you got currents going in, you got currents going out. So it's easy to kind of group them on one side or the other. But when you're doing time, you know, something where a system is changing over time, then, you know, you're kind of assuming there's a T1 and a T2, and you're subtracting one from the other, whereas we know that it's continuous. It's the energy at every instant in time is constant. So it's the continuous symmetry rather than a discrete one, if you will. So you're saying I'm doing it right or I'm doing it wrong? I'm saying both approaches have, have something to be said. That with energy conservation, you know, I like the idea of E at T1, E at T2, E at T3, set them all equal to one another. Right, like the, like the rotor problem. Which is you know, more of the standard way. Whereas with Kirchhoff's law, then yes, some of the voltage equals zero. Makes more sense. Some of the voltage would be zero. Oh, you mean the oh the, um, the yeah. <laughs> some sign of the voltage. The, the sum, yeah. <laughs> Not some of them. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um so but but I'm that's what I'm saying though is with Kirchhoff is that um you're looking at where the first the, the current went through the battery, then the current went through resistor one, then the current went through to resistor two. Yeah. What I'm saying is that there's two types of voltages. There's ones that are plus and there's ones that are minus. So it's very easy to group them. Whereas when you're talking about something in time, like if you're talking about you know, the roller coaster problem, you know, finding you know, the height and the velocity at different times, that's a continuous thing where the total energy is constant at this time, total energy is constant here, total energy is constant here, total energy is constant here, all the way from beginning to end. And it's a continuous symmetry that you lose if you're saying, well, we just pick T1 and T2 and we subtract them. Okay. I'm going to have to think about that some more too. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, and I, can I jump in real quick? I mean, I, I think J Jeremy's point is a valid one, but I think what you're doing with Kirchhoff is you're arriving at several places on the roller coaster and checking the energy. You know, like, so you're doing snapshots and you're saying, all right, it's going to be, it's going to show up differently, but the total is not going to be different. Right. I'm going to have potential in kinetic. You know, that, that if, if I take a look at this, I mean, I, and I kind of like the approach in that I have always found one of the real issues when you're teaching electricity is getting students to have a conceptual sense of what the electrical measurements are, specifically voltage, but the, they don't really even get the difference between voltage and current, it's electricity. And, and I think if you present Kirchhoff's laws in that kind of basic idea of how do these guys act as you go around the circuit, you start to get a behavioral sense of it, which I think nobody really has. I mean, you know, they've used those words for their whole life and, and haven't really defined. Them. And you've now got a very uh, observable behavior that you get some rules for. And I think that's a real step forward. Right. Because current is really the amount of uh, charges that are moving. And voltage is really the amount of Elect, uh, of uh, electrical energy that those charges have. So, um, you know, I, I think that's a, a big confusion with students too, is oh, it's, it's the water at the top of the waterfall and the water at the bottom of the waterfall has lost energy, you know, it inter like, you know, and I, that's something I kind of was like, how is that possible? Because you got, you know, the mean free path and the thing is jumping around. And now you, you, you expended some energy. Something had to come out of the system from being before the light bulb and after the light bulb. It's the same current going through at the same speed, but now it's less energetic. Right. 
we, we, one of the most frustrating teaching experiences I ever had, we were teaching that Lillian McDermott total discovery program with the bulbs and batteries and you couldn't use words you had not, you know, it was, it was all operational definitions. Like you couldn't use the word until you had kind of discovered it on your own. And so we had all of these teachers, this was a teacher's program, who wanted to dive in with statements of what was conserved and what was whatever, and use volts and use current, and we wouldn't let them use any of it because they really didn't know what either of them were. You know, they had half-baked ideas. I mean, some of it's conserved, like current, and some of it's used up, like voltage. And we hadn't defined the terms and we, we had to find ways to get them to discover that so we didn't violate the rule of introducing something that we did not have an operational definition for, you know? And it was, it was maddening. And I think if you sneak in with Kirchhoff's laws there, maybe, you know, you can kind of get the best of both worlds. I don't know. Thank you. All right, let's thank Ann for the presentation. All right. So next up we have uh, Patrick Moylan and he'll be talking about velocity reciprocity and the relativity principle. So take it away, Patrick. Okay, thank you, uh, Ryan. Uh, does everybody hear me all right? Yes. All right, so I'm gonna share screen. All right, so uh, so uh, Anne's point about starting with zero is uh, is very important in relativity, and it's used very often. So if you uh, if you want to show that the so, so that if the net you, very often you you, you the net if, to show that uh, so if the net force is zero in one frame, then it must be zero in all other inertial frames. It's a very important and frequently used. Uh, Thing about zero, so maybe you can look into that. Okay, but so my talk. All right, so uh, so so velocity reciprocity. I guess we most uh, it's just self evident for most uh, beginning physics students. So if a train is moving towards me, it's fifty kilometers per hour. Uh, then rel in in the re in, in the rest frame of the train, I'm moving relative uh, to the train at uh, opposite direction at 50 kilometers per hour. And uh, uh, it doesn't always have to be true. There are non-isotropic space times like the Franck Rote space time uh, from like 1910 and the Lemaitre Tolman cosmology. Uh, so uh, something, yeah. That probably is not so well known. Uh, the so now the relative relativity of motion principle. So it, it goes back at least to the Middle Ages, if not before. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, according to Robert Gilmore, uh, Drexel or Drexel professor, Galileo may have gotten his inspiration from from these these philosopher Middle Ages philosophers. Uh, Definitely the first person to uh, give it a, a precise uh, meaning and, and, and to attribute universal validity to the principle was Poincaré in his uh, uh, 1904 uh, talk at, in St. Saint Louis. Uh, 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 <clears throat> okay, now, uh, here's, here's his statement of the relativity of motion principle. Yeah, it's that principle according to which the laws of physical phenomena should be the same, whether for an observer fixed or for an observer carried along in a uniform movement of translation so that we cannot and could not have any means of discerning whether or not we are carried along in such a motion. And uh, I think the, the, the error, which I'm going to speak about, uh, that's cropped up in a lot of uh, quite, a, not quite, not quite, uh, so, somewhat un, not so uncommon is the, uh, it's very often stated uh, 
uh, the uh, uh, the uh, all the law, laws of physics have to be the same for or the same in all inertial frames, and that that's not quite quite uh, correct, right? It, uh, uh, so, so, so that that, or or rather, what I want to say is that all in that uh, if if something is true in one inertial frame, it should be true in another inertial frame, and that's not quite correct. So, uh, uh, Poincaré insisted that it be a general law of nature without restriction, without uh, with universal validity. In 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 uh, okay. So now now to the. Uh, the misconception uh, uh, that I want to talk about is that uh, the many people uh, uh, attribute uh, the velocity reciprocity principle as a part, either part of the relativity principle or or as a direct uh, consequence of it, and and. Uh, a sole consequence of it, and that and that's just not true. And it's even uh, it, it, it's actually even stated that way in Surway and Jewett uh, that uh, uh, for in, in other physics textbooks, but in particular Surway and Jewett. And uh, you can look into that. Uh, and uh, so so. Uh, and 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 I in in this in this uh, uh, so so I sh I so I show in this uh, uh, in, in so this is the reference and I show that if it can't it can't be true that uh, uh, it can be a con a sole consequence or uh, or part of the relativity principle this velocity reciprocity it, it's it has other there are other assumptions like isotropy of space and homogeneity of space which are necessary in order for it to hold true. It's pretty much clear from the from the fact that there are these other space times, like the Franck Rote space time and the uh, Lemaitre Tolman cosmology, where it's not true. And the relativity principle, of course, is is universally valid. That's it. All right. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, very interesting. Uh, do you have any questions for Patrick? Let me see the. I have I have a question. Um, you're writing on this slide. There's a widespread misconception among physicists regarding the relativity principle, and one of its consequences called the velocity reciprocity. Right. So, uh, Galileo's equation is simply if you're on the stream bank and you're watching the boat go around the river, or if you're on the boat going down the river, the um, the equation is a little different because of your frame of reference. So I don't. I'm, I, I. What do you mean by velocity reciprocity here? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That that actually that part of Galileo's statement that's actually velocity reciprocity. That if okay. I'm, I'm going in a ship uh, with some velocity rel uh, relative to you or if there are two ships and one is and, and one let's say one so so uh, one sees uh, the other moving with one speed then the other will see uh, the first one moving with the opposite with speed in the opposite direction that's actually velo exactly velocity reciprocity yeah and but that's not part and and he 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 didn't define the relativity principle so if you read his his fame his famous uh, 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 description of the re where, where the relativity principles contain, and he talks about doing different experiments inside the hull of a ship and stuff. You, uh, that's all in that, and include. But he he's mix he sort of mishmash of the velocity reciprocity and the relativity principle. He doesn't really distinguish between the two. And uh, uh, but the. Uh, uh, the, the the point is that the it's it's not it's not part of the relativity principle. The, 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 so there's this velocity reciprocity principle, and then there's the relativity principle, and they're distinct. And uh, 
very often in the literature, you can find errors in, in, in American Journal of Physics and, and in, as I say, in textbooks where they, they say velocity, reciprocity is a, it follows from the relativity principle. Yeah. And uh, it, or, or is, uh, it's essentially from only that and nothing more. And that's not true. You need, you need other, you're making other assumptions like that space is isotropic, like uh, because see, you have a reversal of the direction, right? So if, if I'm moving in, in one direction relative to you, then you're moving in the opposite direction relative to me. And, and so if space isn't isotropic, then of course uh, the, you, you can't use that to just, you, you have to use that to justify velocity reciprocity, isot isotropy, that's part of the, yeah. Uh, in addition to the relativity principle. Does that have, does that answer or? And you're and you're not going so far as to talk about Einstein's relativity. You're you're just uh, working here with Dowling and transform. Well, I mean, more it, it it's all inclusive. It's uh, it could be Galilean relativity. It could be uh, Einstein's relativity. It could be uh, uh, any 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 relativistic theory that. Uh, respects the relativity principle. All right, any other questions for Patrick? All right, so let's thank uh, Patrick for his presentation. I have some very subtle points there that are uh, easy to miss. Uh, things about, you know, assuming that space is isotropic and all that, we just kind of come out of the gate assuming a lot of those things, but uh, we do have to explicitly uh, state those assumptions. All right, so I'm gonna give a short presentation now, and this is actually on uh, what are called Fermi questions. So let me uh, bring that up. So my goal here is to sort of stimulate why uh, Fermi questions could be useful in our teaching to, uh, to stimulate critical thinking and quantitative reasoning skills. So for those who are unfamiliar, Fermi questions, are these uh, order of magnitude sort of estimates uh, when you can't do an exact calculation or you may not want to do an exact calculation. Uh, it's what we often call back of the envelope calculations. So in fact, first I have to have a little envelope here. Uh, so there's a lot of reasons why you might do these. So I'd quickly estimate something uh, because the calculation is too difficult or the exact values are unavailable or just doing a feasibility. Uh, estimate. Now, is this something that's even worth trying to do in more detail? Uh, you may be working with limited available information. And kind of another really important uh, idea here is to take a really complicated problem and break it up into more manageable parts. Identify what's important, what's not, kind of boil it down, and then uh, figure it out from there. So, you know, this is what we often call the spherical cow approximation. Uh, and I say dare to be imprecise. Right, if you can come up with a number approximately kind of in your head, that's a good skill to be able to have. Uh, you can make estimates by making upper and lower bounds. So how low could this be? How high could this be? Kind of work with both of those in parallel to give you a confidence interval. Uh, you could take the geometric mean. This is always something that uh, is fascinating to students. That what's the mean of one in 100? Well, 10. That's the number that's in between on a log scale. Or the mean of one in 10 is three. Uh, then you get some of this other fun stuff like pi equals three and pi squared equals G. And a year is pi times 10 to the seven seconds, all that sort of fun stuff. So kind of an easy uh, idea here. What is the mass of Mount Everest? So I don't give you the number here, but if I basically put a gun to your head and said, what's the mass of Mount Everest? Can you tell me, is it 10 to the 12? Is it 10 to the 14? Is it 10 to the 15 kilograms? You'd have no idea. But by doing you know, sort of a simple calculation, okay, well, what's length times width times height? That's volume. Uh, take volume multiplied by density, that's mass. You can actually come up with a pretty reasonable answer, maybe within an order of magnitude or so. Now, if they're sitting there going, well, is it a cone? Is it a this, is it a that? That's not exactly in the spirit, right? It's just sort of a block length times width times height, uh, figure out what the volume is. Uh, maybe multiply by a half or something like that if you want to insist on it. Uh, what is the volume of a cone? Is it one third base times height? Something like that. Now they might start to think of other things like what's the bottom of Mount Everest and there really isn't a good answer to that. 
right? It's just rock all the way down about 8,000 miles till you come out the other side of the earth. So you have to decide, mm, what are you gonna count as the bottom of it? And it's kind of an interesting question because uh, the foothills of the Himalayas are like 10,000 feet. So does it go all the way down to sea level or do we just go down to the valleys? So you can come up with uh, kind of a good estimate from that. Uh, kind of a more speculative one. Suppose that there's 100 extraterrestrial civilizations in the galaxy. On average, how far away would the nearest one be? Uh, so useful information here, the galaxy's diameter is 100,000 light years. So a very Fermi-esque way of approaching this would be to assign them to a grid, something like that. So if there's 100, that would be a 10 by 10 grid, which means the average distance between them is one tenth of the galaxy's diameter, about 10,000 light years. Uh, if there were n civilizations, then the grid would be square root of n by square root of n. So the average distance would be 100,000 over the square root of n. So a corollary, uh, let's say we picked up a transmission from an extraterrestrial civilization, it's 1,000 light years away. What would that imply about the value of n? Well, you do the little math there, it implies there's a thousand civilizations in the galaxy right now. Now, if that civilization were 100 light years away, if it were 10 light years away, if it were on Alpha Centauri 40 light years away, then that number becomes bigger and bigger. So kind of some interesting thinking that you can get to uh, you know, using these. So a couple of questions I just kind of came up with here at random. Uh, how many carbon atoms are there in the human body? Uh, clearly, Avogadro's number is the key there, but then you start thinking about, well, what's the average mass of a human being? Uh, what fraction of your mass is carbon? So there's a lot of fun stuff that goes into that. Uh, how many photons per second are emitted from a light bulb? So got to do a little bit of dimensionality here. Okay, so what's the energy output of a light bulb? What's the energy of a photon? Divide one by the other. All right, so what is the energy output of a, of a light bulb? They can go look that up. Well, what is it, six watts, 10 watts, something like that. What's the energy of a photon? Uh, that's probably the hard one. Uh, the way that I would approach that is take a little LED. Voltage drop on an LED is two or three volts. So you assume that a visible photon is two or three electron volts, probably not too bad. And then do your calculations from there. You get the number of photons per second. Uh, if you were dropped into a random place in the continental U.S., on average, how far would it be to the nearest state border? Of course, it depends. Did they drop you in Rhode Island or did they drop you in Texas? So what could you do there? Well, uh, assume there are 50 equally sized states. That's like a seven by seven grid across the continental U.S. Figure out how big your average rectangular state is. Uh, drop yourself at a random point. How far is it to the nearest border? Uh, how many musical notes are played by a radio station in a year? Uh, this is not a difficult one. So what's the average you know, beats per minute of a song? How many songs do they play in a given year? So how many seconds are there in a year? A couple of calculations there. What is the K value of a bungee cord? So I'm thinking of like when people do like the bungee diving like off of a bridge or something like that. What would be the K value of the cord? A simple way to do that. 1 half kx squared, set that equal to mgh. That gives you a rough ballpark, probably not close enough to get a, a safety permit, but probably within like a factor of two or three. Uh, if you laid out all the atoms in your body in a straight line, how long would that line be? So what do you need to know? How many atoms are in the human body? What's the diameter of an atom? And you'll be surprised how long the answer turns out to be. It's uh, many, 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 many miles, it turns out to be. A fun thermodynamics problem. What is the power output of a microwave oven that boils a cup of water in one minute? So Q equals MC delta T, and then set that equal to the electrical power, or I should say power times time. So there's a little bit of dimensional scaling that goes into that. Uh, what volume of snow lands in Pennsylvania over the course of a year? So how big is Pennsylvania? Uh, without looking it up, how would you estimate that? All right, no Google allowed. So what I found with students, the first thing they do is they take out their phone and they start looking up answers in Google. Uh, how would you figure that out on your own? So my approach would be, well, when I get off at the Delaware River, it's like exit 350 something on the turnpike. And I know that if I drive north on the Blue Route, it's like exit 130 or something like that. And it's still like another half hour. So you can come up with an idea of how many miles that is, or how long it takes to drive to Pittsburgh. And then of course, 
what depth lands, and that depends. Are you in Philadelphia or are you in Erie? Big difference. So maybe you have to take an average of that and try to figure out where the, the happy medium is. Then once they do that, how many dump trucks would you need to cart all that snow away? Uh, how many golf balls could you fit in your bedroom? This is an interesting one because as human beings, we're pretty good at judging one dimensional things. Uh, if I lined up, you know, a thousand golf balls, I could figure out how long that line would be. That's not too difficult, but we are atrocious at estimating area and we're truly atrocious at estimating volume. Uh, how many golf balls would fit in your bedroom? It's an enormous number. <laughs> it's surprising when you do length times width times height. And now if you're thinking, is it simple cubic? Is it body centered cubic? Well, okay, that's like a factor of two in there. But yeah, we're terrible at estimating volume. So that, that can be a real eye opener. And of course, that's why the carnivals have, you know, those jars and, you know, guess how many jelly beans are in there because they know most people don't have a damn clue how to estimate volume. If Jeff Bezos took all of his money in pennies and melted the pennies into a solid sphere, how big would that sphere be? Turns out not as big as you might think, and that's that same cubic scaling, but in reverse. Uh, if you stack up every hamburger sold by McDonald's in the US in 2017, how high would the stack be? I picked that because there is an actual answer that you can go on the internet and you can find some guy from McDonald's who says how many hot or how many hamburgers they sold in a year. Kind of an interesting one. And you got to think about, well, how many hamburgers do I eat in a year? Am I a typical person? Do I eat more or less hamburgers than the average person? Uh, next one. How many U.S. presidents, past, current, and future, are alive right now? So you think, okay, we got uh, Biden, Trump, uh, Clinton, uh, Carter, is that right? And Bush. Five. But that doesn't count future presidents. And we don't know who the future presidents are because they haven't been presidents yet. So how would you estimate a number like that? Uh, probably simplest way is take the average human life expectancy, divide by the average length of a presidential term, say six years, assuming some do one term, some do two. And you come up with an answer that's something like 12 to 15 is the number that would be alive right now. Of course, about half to two thirds of them are still future presidents because I would say most people, maybe other than Jimmy Carter, are president closer to the end of their life than toward the beginning, which means that most of the currently living presidents haven't been in office yet. So kind of an interesting thing to think about. Uh, the final one I put here, how many dentists are there in the US? Another good one, because there is an answer. Uh, the American Dental Association will tell you how many members they have. But now you can think about mm, how many times a year does the average person go to the dentist? How many patients does a dentist see in a day? Uh, how many days a year does a dentist work? And you can actually come up with an answer that's within like a factor of two or three of the correct answer. So it's uh, pretty cool that just by sitting there, you know, using the back of an envelope, you can come up with answers that are, you know, pretty close to the actual results. And that is my presentation. So I'll open it up to any questions. How many physics teachers are there in the U.S. right now? Ooh, that's a good one. <laughs> Right. So, yeah, maybe that's include, include the retired ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Ron, go ahead. Um, well, your thesis, and I totally agree with that. I think it's really interesting. I've always found Fermi questions interesting is that with um, very little knowledge and with kind of crappy um, assumptions, some of your assumptions will be high and some low, and you can come up with a reasonable answer to things like that. That's the idea behind the Fermi questions. But I'm wondering, and with something like, um, how many dentists in the United States, you can demonstrate that that's true, I'm making all these back of the envelope kinds of assumptions and calculations and find out that you get pretty close to the actual number. But what do you do about a question such as the one you posed about if you're dropped at random in the middle of the United States, how far would you be from a border? Because you might find that students come up with a huge range of different answers. And maybe all you can say is, I guess we don't have any idea. <laughs> so what do you do when there's not, I know we're all pre-programmed in our, in our we're, we're programming our students, we've been programmed to think that the point is to get the right answer. And I wanna know, did I get the right answer? And in science, of course, that's not really the issue. You don't know what the right answer is ever. But, but for this kind of an exercise, what do you do when you pose a problem like this 
where there isn't really a way to check factually other than just to say, look how huge a variety of answers we get. I guess we just really don't know. Well, this is a case where we could, I mean, we could do the experiment. We just airdrop students randomly and then have them march to the nearest border, but you could do it computationally, right? You could simulate a map of the US if you could somehow program in the state borders and then just pick random positions, right? right? Random number generator, drop somebody in there and then figure out the shortest line. You could do that, but is that what you actually do in a class? That's what I wonder is, is that what you actually would do then after that exercise? I think that would be complicated to have them actually do that unless you had it pre-made because I would say the program itself is not that difficult in principle. It's programming the map and all the borders, getting that vector figure essentially sorted out. But do you find that if you're going to do this exercise with your classes, do you think that it's important that you yourself have the correct answer to share with the class after the activity or is that just do you sometimes deal with it saying I, that's really interesting how what a variety of answers we get well maybe a mixture is best that there are some that you can say yes this is the actual answer we call up the ada and they tell us how many dentists there are whereas in some cases like like the mass of mount everest we can say there is no real answer because it depends on where the bottom is and understanding that is in fact the goal right sometimes you know the road trip it's not the destination it's the trip there Right. And in some cases, we just don't know. Like uh, the ultimate Fermi question is the Drake equation, right? Of calculating how many extraterrestrial civilizations there are. The answer doesn't exist. And I think ultimately the point of that exercise is that people get numbers all over the place and you go, oh, we don't know. Right. So not everything is known. All My ninth graders would bring in a dartboard and throw 10 darts at, a, you know, a picture of the U.S. <clears throat> and just see where they land. That would do it too. Yeah. That would be a low tech. Um, can I jump in? Yeah, I mean, I, Ron, I, I, I think, you know, to me, this is the answer, you know, let's throw this in with the Chabay and Sherwood course, you know, and like, let's get comfortable with uncertainty. Um, but in terms of questions, because we, we have used this a lot with our summer program, because we got time and we don't have to do grades and we don't have a curriculum. Um, but one of the things that I think is, is neat to watch happen, because you throw these things out to students, is that we've got a question we don't know the answer to. We've got four or five groups all working on it, and they all come up with answers that are in the same ballpark. And, and that is one of the essences of why science gets credibility, is that we're dealing with these unknown answers and we got people all over the world converging on one response. And, and so I think that it's a really neat distillation of that process as well. Um, so that, uh, you know, I think there are many ways to address it. Barry's point, it, it is neat to say to them, okay, now that you've come up with a theoretical answer, can you model this and see how it looks? And his low tech uh, darts on a map would just be a, a rip, you know, you could do that in a grade school class to some merit, you know. Um, but I think there's a lot to be said for that. I be, because it really does talk about getting out of your comfort zone. I mean, those kids do not want to be responsible for providing the estimate that you work with. You know, they want they want that to come from an authority figure. And you know, what you got to emphasize to them is when you're out in uncharted territory, there are no authorities, you know, and you got to start figuring this out on your own. Thanks, uh, Bob. I, I, I also wonder if you could take this uh, question or idea a step further. If you have a bunch of people who are providing an answer, the more the better, uh, and then just sort of disregard how many me different methods there may have been, but that the mean may in fact come out to be very close. I, I know there was some statistician, I don't remember if it was Galton, that, that it was at a, uh, a fair where they had to find the weight of the cow uh, to win a prize in the 
weight, the statistical answer, the average of all the people who took a guess was itself very close to the mass or weight of the cow. Yes, it's the wisdom of the crowd, right? You're sort of eliminating the like three sigma outliers and taking the average. But right. it does presume that there's some information going in. Isn't there yeah. a fable of people had to guess the length of the emperor's nose or something like that, but no one had ever seen the emperor? So it's, it's a meaningless value in that case. But, but your observation that we are really horrible at understanding um, areas and volumes or logarithmic growth, for example, if you think what the average person believes determines what's likely to be true, that's really horrible science. So um, if you say, yeah, uh, you, you poll a lot of people and the average turns out to be pretty close to right, that only works if you independently know what turns out to be right is. If there's no way of knowing, polling a lot of people and having a lot of people do it and say, oh, look, we all got about the same answer. There's every reason to believe we all got very, close to being horribly wrong in the same way. And I think they have to point that out. The, the danger of groupthink. Well, yeah, or just that we all share exactly the very same limitations, our ability to uh, understand logarithmic growth, you know, intuitively, we're really, really, really bad at that. Well, I, I would suggest though, that you give some answers that are testable or some questions that are testable and some that aren't. Uh, and you fall back on those critical points about science of reproducibility and predictive. And in other words, if you get this answer, if you give the question to somebody in California, will they get that answer? Okay, so maybe you don't know what's right, but it's pretty damn weird that he could do it in California and, and agree with you. And then is it predictive? You know, if you get three cars and put them here, does the bridge break? You know, like, oh, okay. So we, we were pretty good on estimating the weight of that thing or some such, you know? So, so I think there are ways to bootstrap yourself up to credibility here. And it, it's a teachable moment. I mean, you're, you're completely right. You know, we've got to, you know, the, the difference between stereotyping and science is, is incredibly thin, you know, <laughs> I mean, like, we're gonna collect some data and draw some conclusions. And, and so we decide that some nationality is stupid because we've got a couple of examples. Um, and so how do we tell people, well, you know, we wanna collect data, we wanna draw conclusions, but this was a bad case of it, you know? And, and I think that's uh, something we might have an opportunity to work with in Fermi questions. Well, one of my favorite examples that you could share with the class is, um, it, if you took every bolt out of the Brooklyn Bridge and laid them all end to end, that bridge would fall down. I've always thought that was a really fascinating result. Well, there's the one about the three birds sitting on a power line and you shoot at one of them, how many birds are left? Yeah. <laughs> all right, so any other questions? I just, I just had one little part here. There was yeah. a, uh, a demo show at, I think it was Sun Valley, a bunch of years ago, and it was raining and I didn't want to bring out all my equipment. So I brought a bag of popcorn. I think Mark will remember this. And so my demo <laughs> was just a bag of popcorn. So I picked the first like five people or 10 people in a row or something and said, so uh, here's a three by five card. Look at the popcorn bag and estimate the number of kernels in the popcorn bag and write it down and write your name, but don't talk about it. So we passed the bag around, everyone wrote down their number, their name. So I collected the cards. I put on the chalkboard everyone's name and their estimate, the number of popcorn kernels in the bag, 400, 300, 1200, six, you know, whatever it was. And we just did a quick average. And I said, okay, so I passed the cards back. And then uh, I said, all right, we're gonna try something now. I'm gonna give you guys a second chance, take another look at the popcorn bag. And everyone who had originally made the, the estimate looked at the popcorn, wrote, I said, just write your second estimate on the card. So we did that. So, you know, it's a stupid little game, but then we collected the cards and put the numbers down 
And we knew the average, let's say, was, I'll just pick a number, 600. A couple people for the second guess said 600. And they just said, hey, I'll go with the average, 600. A couple people, not many, didn't change their value at all, especially if someone said like 1,200. Their second guess was still 1,200. And then, you know, but the whole point of the game was how many people changed their second guess in the direction of the middle, the mean, the regression towards the mean. Not that that gives you truth, but that's human nature. We tend to, you know, con congeal, congest, whatever it is, you know, redirect our values, some of us, towards the average, the average wins, yeah. So it was interesting, even with, you know, 10 physics teachers, like eight out of the 10 changed their values in the direction of the mean. One person didn't change his value at all. I won't tell you who that was. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like you learn a lot by a silly game like that by thinking, how much does the group influence what I think is truth? Whether it's, you know, in a science thing or counting popcorns or whatever, uh, the regression towards the mean is just a human trait. Not everyone follows that. But that was an interesting demo because I couldn't bring the stuff I wanted because it was raining. Uh, did anyone go further from the mean in their second guess? Once in a while, yeah. I, I forget that particular night. Barry, uh, I've done that activity. And uh, first of all, it never rains at Sun Valley. But uh, I've done that activity, and I, I, seem to get the, <laughs> I, get, I seem to get the anarchist students that do go further from the mean. Do you ever get one or two that just quotes the mean, if you actually, or the median sometimes? You, you get someone who says, well, I'll go with the average. They admit they're biased totally. What about people who chose to uh, on the other side of the mean? Anybody leap over? Like instead of saying nine hundred, now they went down to four fifty or something. Because <laughs> that would indicate like a real recalculation rather than a herd mentality, you know. So I got a negative number of. Did, any, did anybody ever want to know how many were really in there? Of course, the ninth graders always do. So we have to open it up, count them, and then they eat the popcorn. And I've got to get another bag for the next class. I usually did that on a day when I knew I just wanted to do something interesting that was, you know, challenging to get them thinking. Um, if you do it with older students, they regress much more towards the middle than younger students. The younger kids are kind of, I don't care what my neighbor thinks, you know, at least at West Town, a boarding school. The younger kids, the ninth graders, were much more independent. They huh. regressed less towards the mean than the juniors and seniors, at least the ones taking physics. Interesting. Yeah. I think if you do it with psychologists, psychiatrists, the regression's like 100%. <laughs> they have no confidence in themselves. That's why. Because they value their peer culture. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I had a question. To, well, I just want to tell you, I just, I always love your sense of humor, Jeremy. <laughs> it's, it's so much full of fun. You can just see it. I, years ago, I used to do the one with, uh, how many piano tuners are there in New York City? And this is back when there were phone books. I would have students come in with a copy of the page from the phone book. And I said, well, that wasn't the point. You were supposed to estimate it. But I also found then that their lines were completely closed to the question. I found the answer. I don't need to do anything else. So if you actually have a question that has an answer, like the number of dentists, um, I'm just suggesting you may end up defeating your purpose because um, you know those people who actually did look up the number of dentists or they actually find out what the number of dentists are, they're closed-minded. Do you know what I mean? It's like, it, 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 we got that number, we're done. And back, you know, in the early 1900s, when they were, you know, doing these, you know, cocktail napkin things, they, they didn't know what the charge on the electron was or what the mass on the electron was. They needed to med estimate it. So um, this is a great uh, sh uh, showing between accuracy and precision too. So the accuracy, everybody could be off by something like if you have like the popcorn in the jar and then there's a, a rubber ball in the middle that nobody knows about <laughs> and everybody's going to be off um and um and I, I and it's also i don't know if you'd have enough but it's a possibility of actually doing a gaussian 
exercise there too, you know? Um, and, um, you know, I, and I, and one other thing, just, just to make a comment before my last thing was about the, the uh, bolts in the bridge. My husband's a civil engineer and, um, you know, one of the things, one of the problems now isn't necessarily that all the bolts are gone, but they now have single point failure for these bridges that most of the bridges in the United States now are actually in danger of falling down from single point failure. So it's not as if that means that if one bolt went bad. So just, I just thought I'd note that to you. But my question here is, I, I don't know a lot about statistics on an upper level, um, but I have a friend who's a social worker. And she said that in order to have a Gaussian, uh, well, not a Gaussian, uh, a, um, say, say you wanna test human beings um, with a psychological test, you have to have at least 59 participants. And I have not been able to find where they get this number 59. I don't know if anybody knows, <laughs> but, you know, and, you know, cause I, it's like, okay, well, why not 50? Why is it 59? It must have something to do with the square root of something or somewhere, but I just thought maybe somebody would know. I'm sure it's, it's not a sharp cutoff. It's not like 59, you're fine. And 58, it's useless. But usually the central limit theorem is said to kick in at like, 30, 40, something like that. So maybe yeah, evidently the, the social time. workers cannot publish anything as a study unless they have at least 59 participants in their study. So I don't know if it was just randomly chosen because I haven't been able to find it in any number. book. Yeah, I guess they have to pick a number somewhere. So they made it that. <laughs> and I guess they, they picked 59 instead of 60 to make it sound like it was, this is the exact number. Got to be that. But it's a great example of how physicists think differently for most other folks, because we know that there's really no difference between 59 and 60, right? It's sort of a transition from the individual behavior to collective behavior. Right. Sort of there's not much difference behavior. between taking statistics on nine people or 10 people, but there is a difference between taking it on 10 people and 100 people. Yeah. Yeah, to answer your, your first point there, yeah, I think that the hardest part is getting them to put down their phones and actually do a calculation instead of just looking up the answer. And I think that that's another argument for having things for which there is an answer and things for which there isn't an answer. Because guess what? Your phone is not going to tell you how many civilizations there are in the galaxy. Right? Your phone isn't going to tell you these things. So how do you work in a situation like that? Now is where you have to take, oh, the envelope. That works. There it is. I folded it up. <laughs> You mean they're not working on critical thinking skills if they just ask Alexa? <laughs> Even if the answer's right? I don't need to think. I have a phone. Mm -hmm. Then, yeah, <laughs> watch the news. <laughs> All right, and, any other questions? And I might uh, cynically suggest that 59 is the cheapest group for which a single outlier could be rounded out to be 1% of the sample. <laughs> you, you know, like I, I'm betting there's some pragmatism in there as well as some statistics, because you know, in an ideal world, you'd have an infinite sample, so your curves were smooth. But you know, that's a pretty tough thing to do before you, if you got to publish in the next six months. <laughs> all right. Thanks all for the questions. I think we should uh, move on. So our next uh, presentation, we're actually getting close to the bottom now, is uh, Barry, and he'll be talking about a simple, inexpensive audio frequency spectrum analyzer. Take it away, Barry. I should have said free. <laughs> ah, free. Is my, okay. is my audio okay? Yes. Because I'm on a headphone mic. Okay. Well, uh, so I, got, I joined a little late here, so I missed the beginnings of the meeting, and it's already coming up to <laughs> one o'clock, so probably folks are exhausted and ready for lunch. Um, it's April, and we made a pact uh, for the uh, Westtown School physics teachers that wherever we were with, uh, you know, kinematics and dynamics and mechanics and collisions and all this stuff, when we ended uh, uh, the winter and had a little spring break, usually end of March, when we started the spring term, we always just left mechanics behind wherever we ended up. I'm thinking especially ninth grade physics. And we started with waves, sound, light, April, 
and May was electricity. So we got a little bit of, you know, waves and electricity and magnetism. And that way we didn't dwell on mechanics. That's probably as I visit schools all over the, uh, the state, actually all over the country, I think probably the biggest mistake we make in high school is we concentrate too much like on the first 10 chapters of these books. And it's mostly too, way too long on motion and then friction on an inclined plane and all this stuff. And you think, yeah, do you ever get to the last part about waves and sound and a little modern physics? So I thought, it's April, we're gonna do sound. So I'm retired, <laughs> life is good, but I kind of miss the classroom. So this is sort of like a, a reintroduction to me. So I'm gonna do share screen and I'm gonna start out with something that I did. Did this pop up? Teaching about sound, do you see what I said? Yes. Okay, so why teach about sound? Well, it's such a cool topic. And the last 10 years of my high school career, I was mostly teaching ninth graders. You know, they, it's a different animal, absolutely. Uh, but sound is really interesting for them. Sound and light is much more fascinating than friction on an inclined plane. I don't know why I dwell on that. But, uh, you know, to teach some of the concepts, sound's part of their life. Electricity's part of their life, light, you know. These are topics we don't want to skimp on if someone's going to have an introduction to physics in high school, and that's the only physics they ever get. So lots of cool things we can talk about. You know, what's the wave nature of sound? How does the human ear work? What's this magic about the speed of sound? And here's a picture of a plane, you know, coming through, boom. Uh, so we spent some time in the beginning just looking at how do we perceive sound? How does that work? You know, not necessarily all the biology of a human ear, but when we say loudness or amplitude of a wave and pitch or frequency, I used to set up a big bass 15 inch speaker and set it up with a uh, sine wave oscillator at like five hertz. And the speaker would bounce up and down five, you know, and everyone could see that. I said, okay, we can see the, the speaker cone moving, physically see it, but of course we can't hear that low a pitch. So, I throw in like 12 styrofoam chips and then gradually turn up the, uh, the frequency, 10 hertz. And then the chips would start bouncing around and then 20 hertz. And by 25, 30 hertz, we, you know, we had some students that, I think I hear that low rumble. Meanwhile, the chips are bouncing all over the speaker. So yeah, and we got up to like 100 hertz, everybody said, oh man, that's loud. You know, and the chips would bounce right out of the, the chips would like evaporate out of the speaker. And then for the uh, middle, you know, sounds, everyone could hear that. For the high pitch, I'd substitute a little, uh, you know, horn tweeter. We'd say, okay, let's see where your frequency stops. So at about 5,000 hertz, everyone was going like this. 10,000 hertz, it's like, no, turn it off, Teacher Barry. Yeah, it was Teacher Barry at West Ham. So 15,000 hertz, about half the class stopped hearing. Even ninth graders, 15,000 hertz. Um, I could still hear 15K. About 16 or 17K, I lost it. And some of the kids are saying, oh, that hurts, turn it off, up to about 20 kilohertz with a nice little, you know, uh, tweeter driver and, you know, a couple of watts of audio. It was kind of interesting to see where's the frequency range we could hear. For loudness, I said, okay, so let's play a sound. So I'm gonna do this on a little speaker right here. Let's play a sound and here's 1000 hertz. But it should be coming through my Zoom microphone. Do you guys hear that? Yes. Okay, so that's a thousand hertz. It's kind of an annoying pitch, it's a sine wave. What if I increase that by one decibel? Could you hear it get louder? Let's try that, one dB louder. That was one yeah. dB louder. Another one dB louder. So that's two decibels louder than the original. One more dB. One more dB. Well, now it's vibrating. So it's kind of interesting to, to do even in a class with a calibrated meter. And I'd often have a little decibel meter, you know, in front of the speaker and then project what the loudness was, but say, close your eyes, you know, <laughs> close your eyes and see if students could detect at what stage did you hear it get louder? And it was about 2 dB, maybe 3 dB. 3 dB, technically, that's a doubling of the intensity. So in other words, we weren't very sensitive at hearing small changes in loudness. That was interesting for the kids. And I'd say, all right, I'm going to play a pitch, and it's say 440 or something, A4. 
I'm going to increase its loudness. Tell me when you think it's twice as loud. And, you know, by the time everyone raised their hand and said, now I think it's twice as loud, it was like 10 dB more, en you know, 10 times more energy. So it was kind of interesting to see the perception of pitch and loudness. Almost everybody, when we do sound, talk about the speed of sound. Ah, it's cool. You can talk about how sound moves. Uh, the comment that Mark made about the, uh, you know, waves in a uh, string. I would take a like a four-string guitar or something and tune them so they all played the same pitch. But they all saw it was the same loudness. Now, you know, some of the strings are thicker. I'd say, how, how did I do that? I mean, look, I four different strings. And they're all playing, you know, let's say an A or whatever note it was tuned to. Like, how did that happen? You know, so we'd look at, this, you know, study the tension and stuff. Uh, speed of sound and air, you know, like everyone does that classic... Uh, experiment with tuning forks and a tube of air and so forth. Um, it's always fun to talk about, well, how, why does sound work so well underwater? <laughs> you know, the humpback whales have a great time talking to each other. They seem quite able to communicate whatever they're doing. Um, how, does, how does sound work underwater? It's, you know, five times faster, really works well. How come? Um, I lived at West Town School where we had a lake. And since I was teaching mostly boarding students, We'd go down to the lake one night, and at sunset, you know, we'd take a little snack, <laughs> a picnic, a physics picnic. The bats would come out of the lake house and go hunting. And chirp, 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 you know, the bats lived up in the uh, roof. And they'd be eating up insects. You know, this is, uh, you know, April or May. But I had a little device that was used for finding steam leaks underground. So the microphone was very sensitive to ultrasonics. Steam leaking underground makes a high pitch sound, and you can walk around the ground and find out where your steam leak is. Then you dig up, you know, and fix the leak. Anyway, I had one of these industrial uh, ultrasonic detectors. The microphone picked up the ultrasonic, and in the radio itself, it converted that to human audible sounds and came out of a normal speaker. So I would just aim the microphone up at the bats in the air flying around, and we heard out of the speaker, chirp, 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 chirp. The kids wanted to know if we could reverse it, you know, talk into the mic and get, you know, talk to the bats. I said, no, that, that doesn't work. But it was interesting to see just, you know, how sound and bats works. Uh, Mark's talk really was my intro. What does sound look like? Uh, you know, like, what, what do you mean, what does sound look like? I think I know what it sounds like. So what we can do is use an instrument to convert the sound wave into something we can see, obviously, you know, some sort of a... Uh, uh, Spectrum. There's a, a wonderful, wonderful app that's free. It works on Windows called Spectrum Laboratory, or uh, it has some other names too. But there are a couple of these I found online, and they work very well. Most of them are free. This particular one's called Spectrum Lab, and I know the guy that developed it. He's in Germany. He happens to be a ham radio operator, DL4YHF, and I've been a ham for 60 years, so I know this guy. And he gives it away, and it's a fantastic uh spectrum analyzer, audio spectrum, not, not radio spectrum. Uh, here's the details if you ever want to look this up. Just Google Spectrum Lab. That's the, his official one, uh, his official name, uh, Boischer. So I took some slides a minute ago, well, about two hours ago, and you can do two things with this app. You can show what sounds look like at a function of time. So the x-axis, the domain, is often called the the, the, the time axis, and the vertical would be the intensity of the sound, how loud it is, essentially. So this was uh, a live microphone with me going, ah, uh, and I can do that again in a minute, but I thought if it doesn't work, at least I've got a sample for you. So it's kind of interesting to see kind of a picture of, in this case, my voice saying, ah, uh, wow, that's kind of interesting. Look, all these bumps, it must mean something. So the other thing you can do with the app is instead of looking at energy versus time, this is milliseconds, what we can do is split it up and look at it in the frequency domain. That means the horizontal represents pitch, frequency, from zero hertz, nothing there, up to about five kilohertz. Well, because my voice stops, you know, somewhere down here. So this is me again saying hello, no, ah, and you can see a couple of the different pitches in my voice. That's a pretty complicated sound, but you know, if you, you can hear, ah, there's a lot of sounds there. So I thought, let's start with something really, really simple. 
here's a 440 hertz tuning fork. So here it is right here, tuning fork. So here's a picture of that 440 hertz tuning fork. And you see there's one big blob here at 440. There's also a little energy here at 880. Oh, that's interesting. And a little bit more energy here and here and here. And those of you that are used to looking at uh, harmonics, um, partials, harmonics, overtones, whatever you want to call them. So the tuning fork is actually playing more than one sound at once. The dominant sound, unless I clamor it too hard, is 440. At least it says A4, 440 on it. But what do we see? Well, the time domain picture is a nice, smooth, pretty smooth wave. And it's beating back and forth, back and forth, 440 oscillations per second. Otherwise, hertz. But I can see on this graph, wait a minute, it's more complicated. So there's information on the, uh, the uh, what we call the FFT, the audio spectrum, that I can see on the time spectrum here. It looks like this thing is beating in more than one pattern. 440, 880, and it looks like 1300. So the second harmonic, the third, the fourth, but there's less energy here. The dominant sound is this one. Huh, that was cool. How about a two-tone train whistle? I just happened to have that here. The recording was made an hour ago. There's one tone. There's a second tone. But what's really cool is if you blow both, a little Vernier giveaway. How many tones do you hear? There's the two. But there's actually mixing and you're getting more than. So here's the original two tones. Plus you're getting the difference and the sum and then some other harmonics. So look at the time domain. That's really complicated. I should have spread this out so you can see a little better. But anyway, we're looking at the waves that we hear. So it's really kind of fascinating to combine the two. Uh, here's a simple metal chime. Simple, I mean, it's just, uh, you know, something like this. The shorter one, higher pitch, the real short one, much higher pitch. So I just hit one to make this sound. So you can see that one chime is producing one dominant wave, but also there's a little harmonic energy here. So, plastic recorder. So here's a little $3 plastic recorder. Really simple. I always take this uh, kayaking because I can't break it. <laughs> anyway, pretty simple sound, but look, whatever, no, I think I was playing an A here or something. There's harmonics. It's not just one sound. Uh, like if Mark did the string with one pluck of one string, you'd get a whole harmonic series here. It looks pretty simple here, like a simple roller coaster sine wave. But when you look at it in the frequency domain, you can see there's more detail here. Um, here's a wooden recorder. This one's like 50 bucks. And you can hear it sounds a little different. It's a sweeter sound. Different structure completely here. It still looks like a nice sine wave, but you can see it, there's multiple sounds coming out of this. And it depends on what note you play and how hard you blow. Uh, this one's kind of cool. Um, Native American, it's just a hollowed out cedar log. Anyway. Why am I showing you all this? Because this is what the ninth grade kids love to do. They can spend a week doing this, especially the kids that are musically oriented. They can come in with a trumpet, a French horn, a this or that, and kind of compare. Uh, it's interesting if I ask two or three musicians, let's all play the same note. Let's say, you know, middle C. So they play a C and we look at it, we hear it. Now, a violin and an oboe, they don't sound alike, but they're playing the same note. Why? Here, look at the obvious here. The spectrum shows us which are the notes coming out. And uh, just a simple gadget like this, <laughs> you know, 30-year-old little $10 keyboard today. Um, oh, it timed itself out. So if I play a A on here,
One of the things you can do is look at what happens when you make a chord. Why do some chords sound cool and some do not? Uh, so let me stop this, stop share, and go to a live one, and then we'll end it because I think everyone wants lunch. So here's the app. It's not working as well as I'd like, but okay, so here we go. So the microphone's not my Zoom mic, so if I go hello, oh, I, I need to do screen share. I forgot screen share. <laughs> now, do you see it? Jeremy, do you guys see the uh, yes. whole thing now? Is that a yes? Yeah, yeah, we okay. can see it. All right, so let it me step back a little updating, bit. But, uh, it's there. So it's picking up the voices that are in the room, but the Zoom audio is coming into my headphones. So the only audio it's getting is the mic in front, which is going to be my voice right now. So if I just try something like this, you can see what it looks like live. Anyway, you could play with this for hours. Let me unshare. So this was the app I wanted to show. Um, it was free. I mean, it's a beautiful spectrum analyzer. Uh, the resolution you can get this, it depends on your sound card. But I could easily get one or two hertz resolution if I use a long enough time for a good uh, Fourier transform in FFT. Let me stop because everyone wants lunch at this point. Uh, why do I want to mention this? It's just a beautiful time in the year to just drop mechanics and start something new. And why sound? Oh, the kids are really interested in sound. The musicians, it really like brings up all kinds of things about the physics of uh, music and musical instruments. And it's easy to introduce some stuff about frequency, vibration. We used to take the kids out with these 10 meter springs and attach them to a tree and have them make a standing wave. Mark was talking about standing waves. And then make a standing wave with two waves, then with three waves. And with a stopwatch, they could time it and they could pretty much figure out the speed of the wave in the spring, 10 meter long spring, the speed of the wave has nothing to do with how fast you shake it. You fa shake it faster, you get more waves, but the speed of the wave stays the same. So then we'd have them pull in some spring, make it tighter and try it again. And now the wave goes faster. So they learned on a very simple experiment that the speed of the wave in the medium, whether it's air or in a spring, doesn't depend on the source itself, it depends on the medium. That was beautiful. It took us one or two lab days to demonstrate all of that, but then they really believed it. So let me stop. Great, thanks, Barry. Great presentation. Any uh, any comments or questions for Barry? Round of applause. Sorry for stealing some of your thunder there, Barry. But if I heard him correctly, I think he, he called for an encore. <laughs> Don't play anything recognizable or we'll get hit with a copyright strike over on YouTube. <laughs> there was a very, very well-known uh, Macintosh program written by a guy, a uh, professor of music at Dartmouth, and he did it the reverse. Uh, this is uh, Lisha Huggins, good friend. Anyway, you'd play something. Like, uh, we did this at an AAP conference. I brought one of my good recorders, <laughs> $50 Israeli recorder, and I played something. He recorded it using a Mac. And then he removed some of the overtones and he made it sound like the $5 cheap recorder just by removing some of the stuff. Um, so it, it was just written for a Mac. I said, oh man, write it for me for Windows. He said, I don't touch Windows. <laughs> Ron. Uh, Ron. Um, af after demonstrating to a class that the speed of the wave in the slinky wasn't dependent on the wavelength or the frequency of the of the wave or the amplitude of the wave that you send, I would always smack my forehead and say, well, we always knew this because if you're listening to a choir and some of them are singing high pitches and some are singing low pitches and they're harmonizing at the same time on stage, way back in the cheap seats up in the balcony, you still hear all those sounds arriving at the same time if they're made at the same time on the stage. And the loud notes and the soft notes that a, a band produces at the same time on the stage, all arrive at the back of the auditorium at the same time. So of course, different amplitudes and different frequencies travel at the same speed. It, the speed only depends on the... That's the adult yeah. logic. But the kid yeah. said, if I shake it harder, shouldn't it go faster? <laughs> so I say, well, go out and do it again. <laughs> 
Beautiful. It's, 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 other... it's a good topic because it lends itself to so many human interests with teenagers. Other questions for Barry? All right. Thanks, Barry. That was great. We're getting just about to the end. I think uh, Donald had uh, something that he wanted to share. Okay, hear me okay now? Yes, good. Uh, well, I've been retired for about 20 years and um, I sort of tried to do what Barry did for most of my career, teach mechanics and then touch, teach other things, electricity, nuclear and so forth. Uh, they changed the way the classes went at the end of my career so that we didn't have physics for the whole year. We had physics for half the year and had the uh, class time about twice as long. That worked good, except we lost all the lab time. So we actually lost a lot of time. Uh, I was listening to the idea of active learning and <clears throat> I ended up thinking about what I used to do. And I actually did a lot of active learning, but not very mathematical. There was a program that was uh, <clears throat> working for Apple computers on misconceptions. And to introduce the students to a topic, I would give them a worksheet and they were to figure out what the answers were for about five different questions. Very started very simply. Here's some dots with a small separation. What's the velocity? How about for a larger separation? What if the dots got increasingly larger separation? And <clears throat> they would make their estimation and it was like an ABC thing. And then I would run the program and they'd actually see what was happening. <clears throat> I'd take some of those questions and put them on the, on the test at the end of the unit so that <clears throat> uh, they they had some interest in figuring out what the right answer was when I run the computer. But that was the introduction to the topic. Um, I also was uh, very non-mathematical in some other approaches. Uh, <clears throat> typically, as you introduce them to an object at rest, stays at rest, object in motion, stays in motion. And rather than uh, try to figure out any mathematical way of doing it. I cleared a table, put a tablecloth on it, put the cafeteria tray on it, and I proceeded to rip the tablecloth away from the tray. And they would all go, oh, wow, look at that. And I says, well, you're in groups. You're all going to try that. So um, another one was I put a playing card on my thumb, put a coin on top, click the, the card, and if you did it right, the coin would stay there and the card would go flying. We did the one with the, the hoop, where you put an object on top and try and move the hoop and see if it would fall straight down. Another one I tried was uh, we'd get a, a cart on wheels and we'd get it rolling. And the object there was not object state at rest, but now an object in motion is going to stay in motion. We did it again, and this time we had a little passenger on the cart. And we got the cart going, and we stopped the cart suddenly. And they'd say, oh, yeah, let that guy go flying. That's the seatbelt thing. And the thing with the tablecloth, they would say, oh, yeah, we've seen that on TV with all the, uh, <clears throat> all the settings and <clears throat> for the table and uh, the dinner, and they'd rip it away. And so uh, then I did another one with the same lab time with a large weight with a string on top and a string on the bottom. And I had them try that. So, <clears throat> so rather than doing anything mathematical, they would do the tablecloth and they'd, I'd hear them saying, I did it, I did it, yay, or the card. They do it, 
And so as they went around the room in their groups, they try all these things. And my idea was, if there's a misconception they have in their mind because of the way they grew up, maybe this would change it to see how it really works out. Um, one of the big misconceptions, I think, is when uh, people grow up, they think more of how forces work in the Aristotle way. To make something move, you have to keep pushing it. Well, <clears throat> we talked about that. I'd get a cart going in front of the room and give it a nice push and say, it's going and, and I'm not pushing it. So what? And then it would slow down. I said, what's happening there? And they say, oh, friction. We can't believe in Aristotle's way of motion and Newton's way of motion if you don't have friction. So uh, we went around with, with those things as an introduction. So my whole idea was uh, for the students not to start off with some fancy lab and do some math, but to, to give some, some physical uh, input into what's going on and to think about it that way. Okay, that's about it. All right, thanks so much, Donald. Any questions for, uh, for Donald? Just one comment to Don. Good to see you. I haven't seen you in 10 years. Um, a lot of the lab equipment now, Vernier, Pasco, and so forth. So now there's a cart, and it sends the data, you know, wirelessly, Bluetooth, to the computer. And you push the cart, however you want, uphill, downhill, friction, no friction. And it plots out the graphs of velocity, acceleration, time. It just, you know, spews all this stuff out. And I watched one class do that, and it, it was very good. I sensed... But I asked one of the kids, do you have any idea how the information gets from the cart to the computer? And what actually is, tell me what's acceleration. I'm a third grader. They couldn't do it. So there, there's a danger here. And as the technology is getting super sophisticated, very accurate and precise, that we're losing the, you know, put six dots on the page and tell me if the cart's getting faster or slower. Uh, some of the classes don't start with a more gutsy way of looking at motion. They jump right away to these carts in Vernier software. Then observation. Another retired dude. Thank you. Ron, go ahead. Uh, I just think that the low tech, I, I really ad admire that. Thanks for sharing that because um, it occurs to me the more high tech black box and the FET uh, uh, simulations and stuff, they have their place. But certainly 200 years ago, people were teaching science pretty effectively. And we had some really great scientists in the last 100 years or so. And they didn't have smart boards and they didn't have, you know, so we're spending an awful lot of money for like a million times better technology for teaching physics. I don't think we're teaching the students a million times more physics or that we're teaching it a million times better. And I just really like that that really simple hands-on experiential approach. So thanks for sharing that. You're welcome. I think there's a danger as you know things become more and more uh, sophisticated that we lose touch with the basics. I mean, maybe in life, I mean, what if we had like a Carrington solar flare, you know, how many of us know how to ride a horse and milk a cow and <laughs> do things like that? <laughs> we probably wouldn't last long <laughs> without that. So yeah, sometimes getting in touch with the basics is, uh, is really important. All right, any other questions for Donald? All right, does anyone have anything else to add? That is the last of our presentations, unless anyone has other business for, uh, for the meeting. I can add some other part, if you don't mind. Yeah. Oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, to study energy, I try to do a low tech approach also. Uh, we'd have some uh, kids draw graphs of what the potential energy was at a certain time, kinetic at a certain time. So you would uh, do a bowling ball tied to the ceiling. High potential, low kinetic, goes down to high kinetic, up to uh, high potential. And they try to, uh, describe what's happening a little bit 
uh, to try to match the graph to the motion and describe it a little bit. And we did uh, other things like tossing a ball up into the air, what happens to the kinetic potential. The real interesting one was trying to do a ball bouncing on the ground. And the elastic at the bottom was something they almost never thought of on their own. So uh, uh, we did that. And uh, I appreciate the fact that uh, it got very technical very quick. And, uh, and, and this way, I thought it was maybe we were talking earlier about the second thing. Well, maybe this would be the first thing. Maybe we'd do this stuff and then do something technical along the lines. Thank you. I think, Mark, I saw your hand up. Yes, if last piece of business, if nobody objects, uh, I'd like to get a picture of everybody for the website. So if you're okay with having your camera on, go ahead and turn it on for a moment. Um, otherwise, I will go ahead and get ready to take a screenshot. Let's take one or two more. Nobody blink. Nobody freeze. Thank you so much, appreciate it. All right, that's great. And we will have the recording available on YouTube. So I'll send out a link once it uh, rolls over into the uh, permanent uh, repository there. And also send that out to the SEPs uh, membership once we get the email group uh, up and running. And maybe we'll get it uh, linked from the website as well. All right, so if there's no further business, we'll uh, close this uh, demo day. I think it's been a great time. Hard to believe it's three and a half hours, but. Uh, <laughs> That might actually be one of our longer demo days. Usually we're running about two or three hours. But, uh, yes, hopefully uh, we're going to have a nice uh, in-person meeting for the fall. Maybe we'll have something uh, between now and then. Hopefully COVID numbers will uh, stay down. That BA2 and uh, the rest of the uh, Greek alphabet will spare us. And uh, if there's nothing else, I will see you at the next meeting. Invite Thank you. your colleagues. Jeremy. Jeremy, do we have a do we have a date and or a time uh, or location for the fall? Meeting? Uh, no, we don't. But actually, if any folks want to hang out for a little bit to talk about the fall meeting, uh, maybe we'll do a little uh, short meeting now just to get some ideas. Good luck to the basketball to. team. Yeah, we're playing uh, semifinals tonight and uh, finals on Monday, hopefully. Good luck. All right.